Well, hello and welcome to Kitchen Party, but not just any kitchen party. This is a spooky kitchen party because tomorrow is Halloween and you never know who you will meet <laughs> in the Halloween kitchen. Uh, so let's see who we have here today. Dear God, uh, let me unmute these people so they can explain themselves. Um, we seem to have some kind of eldritch being <laughs> um, and several and several less eldritch beings um let me see look at this look at this that's amazing so, from the from deep below the streets of paris i believe what we have here is a catacomb saint would you like to explain yeah. yourself <laughs> um <laughs> I thought I can't a see a damn thing right now. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm a catacomb saint, you know, in, um, oh, what was the history of them? In like, right after the Reformation or during the Reformation, the Catholic Church was like, we need to get people back on board. So what we're going to do is take up a bunch of saints and just freaking embroider them and throw jewels on them and wrap them in brocade and put them on display. And that'll increase the devotion of the public. And this is, you know, these are the heavenly bodies that the Met Gala was based on a couple years ago. And I've been obsessed with them ever since. And I thought, why not this year do that? <laughs> it's amazing. This is an amazing <laughs> costume. And you, ha you have a mask to go with it too, right? In case you need to go out in public too. Yeah, I have a gold, bejeweled, bepearled mask that I will not put on right now because right. <laughs> I can't see yeah. it. I can't put it on. <laughs> you're already, you're this has to be little... your grocery shopping outfit for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday mornings. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that is that is fantastic. All right. Um, well, anyone who turned in to see uh, to see Jared's Halloween costume and was thinking, I bet it will be a little bit extra. You were not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be more extra. It was going to be so much more. But I don't know Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yes, so we're, we're being hosted by the undead. Um, but we have a really exciting team of guests uh, this week. So I think we will, this month, this year, currently, uh, I think we will go around. What am I going to do? We're like, trying to like, rearrange these little squares. Um, Jordan, would you like to begin by introducing yourself quickly? <laughs> yeah. My name is Jordan Shively. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I write weird things on the internet and sometimes in print. And you can find me at, at Hottest Singles, where I write the Dread Singles Twitter account. David. Ah. Uh, well, I'm David Demchuk. I currently live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And you can tell there's a tiny bit of news in there. Um, and uh, I have written two novels, sort of weird experimental horror novels uh one is the bone mother the other is red x uh which it's just lurking came out. it's right behind you it's <laughs> yes exactly around. i'm afraid already <laughs> and uh it came out a couple of months ago and uh and i've also written a few uh scattered short stories here and there and uh and that's pretty much me i guess i'm dressed as the old man at the gas station who tells the kids that they're all gonna die <laughs> <laughs> That's so valid. Very good. <laughs> Free. <Dude. laughs> exactly. I am Count Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I lasted as long as I could with those in. <laughs> Clearly made for somebody with a much bigger mouth than I have. Um, hi, I'm Premi Mohammed. I'm based in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So hello, fellow Canadian. Um, I'm a scientist and a novelist. Uh, my debut novel came out last year, Beneath the Rising. Uh, the sequel came out this spring, A Broken Darkness. And the last book 
in the duology, uh, which is A Void Ascendant, is coming out next spring. And I also write uh, short stories. And my latest book out is The Annual Migration of Clouds with ECW Press, which is a novella. Amazing. So we're going to, this is a, a cooking and chat show. So uh, our, our resident um, catacomb saint is going to be cooking something for us today. So Jared, do you want to explain what you're going to be cooking and what the process is? Yes. Let me take the skull mask off first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's in parts. Even nicer. It's, it's bald. <laughs> it's a skull. <laughs> You find your glasses without your glasses. <laughs> oh, I, I barely, I barely found them. Let's see if I can put this on over the headphones. Oh, nice! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm making two things today, actually. Oh, there's my distracting hand. Um, <laughs> making soul cakes and making funeral cakes. I am more excited about the soul cakes, to be honest, but we'll see what happens. So um, the soul cakes were are the ones that I put in the I just found that photo on oh. the internet. And they do I don't know I don't know what the story is, but they do look like something that you would leave out as a treat for the Blair Witch. They have that kind of like old school haunted look to them. So yeah. explain. I will explain. So the medievalists who frequently get after me on Twitter for my inaccurate jokes may take issue with some <laughs> of what I'm about to say. But Great. this is a very tricky thing to research. Um soul cakes were given out in um England for a while, like from when records began up to around the time the Church of England became a thing. Um, there's a similar practice that still happens in Portugal, I think, but it's, I don't know enough about that to say anything more. So don't ask. Um, they're just little, like sort of like cookies, um, spiced, dried fruit, whatever. Um, people come door to door and sing a song about you give us a soul cake and you give them a steak. And the idea is, in some reasons anyway, the idea is that for each cake, you're supposed to pray for the soul of a dead relative of the person who gave it to you. Hmm. However, there are other variations too. Like one of them is like, well, maybe they originated as sort of an offering for the dead. You set them out on All Hallows Eve for the dear departed. Um I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's pretty much gone now. I think there's still parts of Shropshire where they do it. Hmm. But I've never been. I don't know. Um, but I've been low-key obsessed with them. Not obsessed enough to make them. But low-key obsessed <laughs> with them. Ever since reading about them in Catherine Called Birdie. Which is a children's novel that I read at like age nine. And was like, oh my god, that sounds amazing. I will make those. <laughs> 21 years in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to get started on that in a second. I have, oh, I forgot to do my traditional picture beforehand. This is such a weird recipe. It's clearly medieval because it's you got to like mix ale and yeast right. and like sack, which is just sherry and all these spices and things. Hmm. Um, clearly special occasion because even though spices were not totally inaccessible, they were expensive. So. Sack mm -hmm. is just sherry? Sack. Oh, I think you said sap. No, 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 like, no, 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 no. I learned no. something new about trees today. <laughs> <laughs> you can't ferment some Please sack use. to produce an alcoholic beverage, yeah. but that's not that's what true. this is. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, that was Very so much cool. talking. The funeral cakes themselves, I may say more about when I get to them, but they're basically just like you give them out at funerals, and it's more of an American thing that has also died out. Okay. Um, it ties into the tradition of sin eating, I think, mm. where you would put a red chest of the deceased and then hire somebody uh, who life is miserable <laughs> and has nothing to lose <laughs> to eat the bread and thereby take on the sins of the departed. And then the departed can get into heaven yeah. and the sins stay here on earth with the the random guy that you dragged off the street to do this for you. Yeah, <laughs> Is, so you're I, saying that when you have when you have a snack, it can be a sin. Um, only if you eat it off the chest of a dead person. 
which somehow doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I saw. Well, I mean, how often I... is that going to happen in your life? Five, ten times, you know. Um... <laughs> Depends on how many dead people you encounter, generally. Or yeah, make, I mean, snacks. if you can't get some, make your own. Make I don't your know. own. Uh, yeah, ding. find a garden. Kink acquired. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kink quest journal noise. <laughs> <laughs> I was googling to try and find a picture of the funeral cakes, and they're sort of they're sort of cookie like, and they're they seem to be related to Victorian funeral biscuits, which were more or less. Mm -hmm. Funeral biscuits thing. are a separate strand of this braid from right. funeral cakes. I mean, right. Funeral okay. biscuits is also my stage name, so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I forgot to get a bottle opener, so I'm going to stand up in my very hilarious way that I stand while wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> and grab my bottle. Yes, store bought corpses, you know. You can just like run over to the run over to the seven eleven if you're out. Uh, and may I say as a local vampire, thank you for not festooning your entire outfit with crucifixes. I appreciate that. So you don't need to, you <laughs> are yourself blessed. Yes. Yeah, exactly. um, you radiate. Okay, well, the, what, one of my eyes hurts a little bit. The other one's fine, though. So maybe you're only. So you have like constant. a radius of constant turn undead around you, or but you are undead. I think, so well, it's but... like a self-loathing undead turn. <laughs> no, I, I'm incorruptible. Oh, so, that's, so you're not undead. <laughs> you are continually lifed. You're super life instead of undead. This smells gross. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what is this? This it? is that's just a. Borgonia. That's actually really good. It's like strawberry lambic. Ale. Or it's like a berry <laughs> lambic, right? No. I have genuinely have no idea. I just grabbed it in a panic because really, I don't really, really drink ale. They never taste so well, they let's smell. Let's see. It's fine. It's <laughs> a little bit like salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Oil and vinegar? <laughs> I am now very worried funeral. about the kind of He's salad okay. dressing Jared has on his salad. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a dark ale. It's 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 a little it's a little cola ish, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's when when I didn't start drinking till I was twenty six because of bullshit religion stuff, and that was oh, one yeah. of the first. Oh, yeah. beer, that's one of the first beers I started drinking because it didn't really taste like beer because it's a lambic. Yeah. It tastes kind of like a sour lemonade kind of thing going on. Oh. <laughs> That and Blue Moon oh. <laughs> was what, 26, just kicked out of seminary, Jordan drank a lot. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so while Jared starts getting started with that, so this is this involves, well, one more question. This involves yeast. Is it going to have, does the yeast need time to rise, or is it just kind of like? It does, so it's weird. I actually put this in the wrong bowl. I am. Do we have to come up case. with a trigger that Jared now has to do shots of the rest of the beer throughout the cooking <laughs> show? I mean, if you don't misuse it, sure. <laughs> are you, oh, well, Jared, are you not a beer drinker at all, or or just not an ale? I drinker? am not. I am not. No. I haven't. I mean, this one actually. I mean, or you, or you could just like you are now. I'll get right now. <laughs> I this cider in the fridge if we're doing drinking games. I mean, we. I could not? go get whiskey. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's only it's only three p.m. now, so why not? You know. <laughs> it's two o'clock in the afternoon over here and I have like stuff to do after this. So of course a lot of it is just publishing emails. So I feel like people oh, those are better dry, I would take right? the <laughs> Like if I reply to those while a little squiffy, literally yep. no one will notice. <laughs> um anyway, yeah, I'm not really a beer drinker because most of the ones I've had have been like very super bitter and I think hoppy mm. or something. So yeah. I don't I'm not Probably a fan not, of that. But yeah. this is mm -hmm. like Jordan was saying, this is tart. It's fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of the, some of those lambics get so tart though that you can feel it taking the coating off the back of your teeth after you drink it. Oh, like I you got this, and it's like, it's like a little like gritty, yeah, because it's like stripping your teeth as you drink it. <laughs> what is it that makes them tart? Is it is it some sort of like fruit fermenting or or? I am many years past my time when I used to be in a beer brewing group, but I think it's like a <laughs> always a fruit as the basis. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a sour. Okay fruit it's almost like a cider mm -hmm. yeah it's i think it's very much in the same family right but it's okay darker did you, usually did you throw the yeast directly into the booze yeah this yeah is my question. yeast are you okay huh. <laughs> <laughs> one of the so one of the things that i think was not mentioned earlier is part of the premise of this show is that i've so never upset. made what i'm making uh, <laughs> so i'm following a recipe that i've never okay. made before I'm doing what okay. they told me to do 
Is it from like 1450 or like? I mean, basically. <laughs> Oh, yeah. because the, the recipe is like, if you put the ale in the thing and that'll replicate the, the barm of the original recipe. And I'm um, like, oh, sure. You can hear like a, the wounded animal yelp in the other room of my pastry chef's spouse, like watching this. <laughs> 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 if, Jared's, if Jared's pastry chef sister is is online, she's going to be uh, snarking fairly soon. <laughs> oh, okay, because Jared's Virgin Mary <laughs> costume is on the <laughs> <laughs> You don't usually see her bones, though. I, <laughs> I know. I grew up in I grew up in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And there's oh, some yeah. different virgins yeah. down there. Yeah. The, the best my one, heart. my favorite, is the Virgen de la Soledad, who has a huge black cloak and all velvet cloak, and all over her little silver body parts pinned all over her. For like people, mm -hmm. you pin the body part you want healed. But what oh. it is is this big metal virgin covered with dismembered body parts, like in all in black. <laughs> Festive. Yep. Fucking okay. rad. <laughs> so and while Jared gets going with that, uh, mixing up the this medieval biscuit recipe, um, yeah, well, I'm going to start asking you guys questions about your, oh my goodness, there's, oh, a, what there's, is, a, there's a specter what? behind you, Jordan. <laughs> 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 years ago this very night <laughs> i do not know There's... what the specter brought me but okay <laughs> so jordan since you're you're sort of like clockwise the next person up um I, I there's a question i've been wanting to ask you about your work and it's teeth what's with the teeth <laughs> i think i just made a lot of jokes about teeth and a lot of like viral ish tweet jokes about teeth and horror and i also find teeth to be really cool as like an aesthetic you know i like the idea of there being teeth where they shouldn't be you know <laughs> also our horse lords command us to gather teeth for the annual tithing of the teeth i mean did you you know the like the horse fact is that horses are born without teeth and they only acquire them by getting teeth tied to them from other animals that then become part of their holy jaws <laughs> yeah. And there's no, there's no recorded upper limit of how many different teeth a horse can fit into his jaws, and it's prehensile. I that was an Aristotle, or <laughs> I mean, have you not seen their lips? That they can like bend them back, you know, and then oh, yeah. if they want to, they just they just keep going back and I'm like a dark flower's petals. This is this is why this is why Jared loves horses so much. I know it's the <laughs> it's, it's, there's, there's it's an practical. account called um that's right tune Mount in for Ennui. horse facts <laughs> noted horse girl Jared. <laughs> <laughs> My partner is undercover in a bunch of horse girl um discords oh. as like a as like a, in like a half fascinated half like anthropologist thing half actually liking it and um so three halves <laughs> the report backs have been amazing. She's gearing up for a let's play a Barbie dream horse, like from the 90s, that computer game. <laughs> oh, God. So, Jordan, uh, I thought I thought we had two horror novelists on the stream. And then Jared informed me that we, in fact, have, have three horror novelists because yes. you also have this happening. Uh, yeah, that, that's going <laughs> to maybe come out next year. <laughs> it's supposed to be the drafts supposed to be done by the end of the year. So and how done is it? <laughs> um, it is about 50,000 words right now. How long do you want it to be? <laughs> um, they want me to make it shorter, but it's going to need a little bit more to finish. Okay. I was thinking it was going to be around 80, 90, um, okay. just based on like what I had written and where I wanted it to go. But my editor was like, uh, you're already over where we wanted it to go. So let's mm -hmm. cut it back. So they were thinking when they said novel, like the bare minimum page yeah. count of novel i guess yeah fifty thousand. yeah um so yeah i have probably another ten thousand twenty thousand to write and then some mm -hmm. art to make because right, it's going right. to be like a found object braided narrative i guess someone called it a mosaic novel the other day yeah. i'm not super up on all the i went to school for theology unfortunately not um <laughs> literature but uh so there's parts that are like just art and fake newspaper pages and there's gonna be some chunks of choose your own adventure game even though we'll have to call it like choose your own possibly exciting event or not because the choose your own Opera. adventure game people in canada are yes. the most litigious company i've ever met <laughs> oh, man. yes they are I, I made a tweet that, I, that. I, I made a tweet just talking about choose your own adventure books and yeah. they emailed me to take it down or they were gonna sue me 
Yeah. What? They don't want yeah. you to say the name yeah. if you're you not can't, talking about you their books. You can't use the actual phrase. You but have I think to the find people who came up you will summon them. But yeah. I think the people oh, who yeah. came up with like pick a path, they're not yep. litigious. So if you want to do pick a path, you can do that. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be alliterative, I'm thinking about going the opposite direction and making it be a really long, awkward sentence instead of like choose your own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what's so scary about your book, Jordan? <laughs> you, um, yeah. I what, what fears are you playing on? What dark fears? Like that's the thing. Like uh, horror is such like a big, a big idea and genre. Like I don't think I write scary stuff, mm -hmm. but other people do. So <laughs> I think I'm just writing like weird fiction, you know. Um, but there is a lot of body horror in it. A lot mm -hmm. of like bodies changing and bones twisting and growing into new things. Um, and I just like writing in areas that feel like taboo but not really they shouldn't be so i like to just i just think it's fun and cool the topics i write about but then other people like i when i write about them on twitter they're like now i can't go to bed thanks you know <laughs> like um so i guess people the horror probably is mostly body horror is what right. if people were gonna like start saying there's what kind of, of what body kind of, horror and there's some cosmic horror too cult yeah. horror cosmic horror yeah. exactly yeah so the things i love are cults body horror and then like weird entities mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if i was writing in an area it's probably cosmic horror even though I, there's so many connotations to that that like well i think you could use weird horror i think yeah. weird horror in fact that's what i like develops personally. cosmic horror to a certain extent and mm -hmm. um and it's a it's very much a catch-all you in and, and a very elastic sort of term so and i think it does fit good because like all the weird like pop culture horror stuff i do too you know like mm -hmm. i wrote a body horror flash about like herbie the love bug having his like people <laughs> being absorbed into the tires of his as they worship him all the mechanics cults of herbie <laughs> Yes. Called, called herbivore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> really true form. <laughs> I can't stir anything in these sleeves. So no, right okay. no. Is that saffron? These are just so fancy. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But, but also, I when you're a harder writer, you get so many house. cool people to hang out with. So that's that's, right. that's the real yeah. reason. I get to hang out go. like with David and Premium and Jared. If I <laughs> if I say I'm in the horror kid club. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, my goodness. So Preeti David. tries to pretend like they're not a horror writer. Who does? As look at them. They're just like, no, blood all over their face. I <laughs> 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 Halloween. <laughs> Halloween. I, I took my fangs out. Supposedly they glow in the dark, but I'm not turning off lights to try it. So, Premi, yeah. what is your like, trilogy about? Is it um, what's the topics? What does it cover that are that are horror? Friendship. It's about the power of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about, about horses. Friendship is magic. It's about girls exactly. love for horses. It's my Little Pony. And what kind of, what kind of um, entities and characters are in this book? <laughs> there, there are some entities. I think it's <laughs> to be an entity. <laughs> We can't all have bodies, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> or bodies that stay the same. Bodies change, Jordan. Bodies change. In unimaginable oh my they, gave, they gave me a, a brochure or something about it in like grade five. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is this is disembodied entity erasure right here. I think. <laughs> so you sprouted health. new limbs. <laughs> so there are tentacles coming out of your eye sockets. I'm actually writing down. So you like, sprouted new limbs. Flipping the page. <laughs> what? <is a> title. <laughs> okay, David. I'm gonna. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna move to David next. So uh, I have I I. I I, I really enjoyed Bone Mother, and I just read Red X, and that also has, you know, disturbed my dreams. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I would have told you not to. <laughs> no, <laughs> but in a good way. Um, and I also really enjoyed it because I, too, am um, a, a, a Torontonian, and we're, we're, we're sort of in the same age cohort. So all of your, I was, like, really vibing with all of your cultural references. It's, it's like Red Generation X. <laughs> 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 Uh, when you were when you were like the the, the 90s section you, you you like you you name checked like mac viva glam li lipstick and i was like i had a friend who was obsessed with that <laughs> like i it was great and it's very toronto it's like every single detail i was like there were moments when i was like okay she's getting on the streetcar to go to manic is that the is there a different branch of manic or is she on the 506 like it was like like it was like putting oh. every single like <laughs> yeah yeah i i have to tell you the research was murder because of course my mm. memory is shot the reason I started in 1984 was because that was the year I arrived in Toronto. And so that year, I remember a lot of stuff really well. 
mm. like a year after, I remember nothing. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so when I got into the 90s, it was like, fuck, what was happening? Where right? was Because, of course, one of the problems with, with the queer community in particular is, is that bars just up and die clubs just up and die they're replaced mm -hmm. with other things that thing may only last six months there's absolutely no documentation of it and um, and and people come and go of course people drop dead other people arrive you know and and you and you just you have no idea in particular like narrow slices you know so sometimes I had to like just take a guess some stuff was available at um, the lesbian and gay archives now known as the archives with a Q and um, but not a lot and a lot of the stuff they have is like ephemera you know which is mm. of course there's a ton there's like a lot of matchbooks from bars and clubs mm. and there's a lot of you know ads and flyers and things like that but um, but in some cases like you know a lot of that stuff, you have no idea where it actually falls in the timeline. And the people who should be around to be able to tell us this history, of course, are sadly, many of them are gone. So, so it, piecing that stuff together was, um, was a lot, it was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. Yeah, I imagine. You it came through from... so well, though. Like, yeah, it really showed in the book. Like, I th we've talked about how blown away that book I was by that book and how it was impactful to me on many levels both horror and as like queer literature and as like helping me like work through my own stuff by like living some of the lives of these people. Oh, um, sure. yeah. yeah, I have no, nothing it's, but raves. Well, so. it's, I mean, one of the things <laughs> that was really important to me, I mean, and obviously the research reflects that is that I wanted that feeling of verisimilitude. I wanted, to, and particularly mm -hmm. for some stuff that I had that sort of feeling of like sense memory for particular places, particular, you know, um, um, locations that, that now are just, I mean, that are just utterly erased. Uh, yeah. It was funny, actually, at one point, I went with uh, a friend of mine through uh, a number of places in the book, and I went and photographed them as they are now. And I hadn't seen what had been happening at the site where the toolbox was down on mm. Eastern Avenue for quite a long time. And so when I got there and it was just, it was rubble. It was just, there wasn't even a building. The last time I'd been down there, there was a building and now it was just rubble. And, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and so I took a picture of it, obviously. And when I posted it, there were these people who were like, no. <laughs> and I was like, well, it was hard to be sentimental about it. It wasn't a thing for like 25 years. But uh, yeah. but yeah, it was, I mean, stuff like that. It was really important to try to capture what mm. had actually been there. If yeah, only yeah. for myself and part of my own process with the book. Yeah, so. it's really unsettling, isn't it? Because you think you think of this stuff as not that long ago, and you think no. when you're immersed in it, how could you ever forget it? It's your, it's you know the the material of your life, and then you turn around ten years later, and you're like, wait a minute, what was there? Like who who was there? What was the? What did it look like? It's suddenly yeah, you think like, at least the building's going to last forever, you <laughs> yeah, know, and then yeah. you realize you go back and look at it. <laughs> yeah, everything just gets mowed down, and you mm. and you you know, I uh, there were several places that I remembered that I didn't know exactly where they were. And they were places in my own neighborhood. And I went walking through and I thought, that can't be right. That doesn't look right. I can't figure out how that would ever have been the place that I remember. Yeah. And yeah. have I transposed it with something else or merged it with something else? So that was, that was a puzzle too. But at the same time, I thought, well, I kind of have to own that experience as well. The fact mm. that your memories mutate. Yes. Um, oh, I love uh, that. <laughs> and so yeah i mean much like the body's mutating part of the horror of getting older is your memories mutate as well and yep. the stuff that you thought was rock solid turns out to be built on nothing and you know and it's like what was that thing that i recalled you know yeah. it's really it's really odd it's mm -hmm. a really even odd just i've been i was go, i've been going to toronto since 2008 to 2019 every year yep. and um there was always an after part a queer after party that was at like um, a venue that was LBGQIA and it, every, oh. <laughs> every, um, every two years or so it would change because it had been like mowed down or they lost their lease yeah. and they put in something else. And so like with a, with a startling frequency, it was the venue would change for this certain party that was oh, yeah. always held after TCAF. Yeah, absolutely. I could it be the same space. It could be the same building, but the names would change. The staff would change all of, you know, the whole look and feel of the place would change or some places would just be gone. They would just 
overnight be gone and then you you end up having to find another space another place mm -hmm. for your community and um and that i mean that as the village the gay village in toronto gentrified that of course you know accelerated at a rapid rate because ever the rents were always more expensive people were always having a harder time packing enough people and charging enough in order to keep people you know to keep venues alive and it's particular i mean it was bad enough for like the gay male community but for uh for women it's been awful there there are, mm -hmm. i think at this moment and i think for quite a long time there is no sort of dedicated um women's space um anywhere in toronto right now hmm. and um and then there's of course the perennial question of well who would have the money to run it and do women need mm. spaces anyway? And what do those spaces <laughs> look like? Well, that's a, the perennial a question. Do, the perennial women question need spaces? do women need spaces <laughs> uh, around, along the line, not spaces as much as do the, women need bars? The, do the, women yeah, need, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. what does a women's social space look like and right. how do, and how do women socialize compared to say gay men where the space spaces are often highly sexualized? Um, it's not a lot of people know this, but I have a child. Uh, the child is now 31, so it's kind of hilarious to call <laughs> to call him a child. Uh, but the uh, his mother uh, was one of the women who ran a um, a bathhouse night at uh, what was traditionally a gay men's bathhouse, uh, the club baths, um, and it was called the Pussy Palace, and yeah. um, and it was subject to a rather notorious raid. And but when that whole thing began, there was that question of well, would women go? Would women mm. go to a bathhouse and what would that look like? What would what would women engaging in the same sort of way that men traditionally have engaged sexually? What would that look like? And I mean, there was a real fear that if they would rent the space, they would show up and no one would be there. There'd be like six yeah. people. And, and they all sort of <laughs> thought to themselves, all right, well, then it's going to be just us. <laughs> but in fact, people turned out in droves, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, which, of course, was, I think, one of the reasons why it was rated was because it was quite transgressive. And also it was quite popular and very much in the public eye. So um, but that opened up a lot of questions, I think, about what gay spaces are um, or queer spaces and trans spaces are, mm. what sexual spaces are. Um, how they're distinct from uh, from straight spaces, if we can call them that. And 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 what does it take? Like, how essential are they to the community and how do you keep those going in order to, it, to create that kind of integrity within the community? Um, because, of course, as a result of gentrification, a lot of a lot of queer spaces and this isn't just true for Toronto. A lot of queer spaces have dispersed across mm, the city mm -hmm. and a lot of them have dissolved and people go, oh, well, they've been replaced by apps. They've been replaced yeah. by social yeah. media, online spaces. They've been, yeah. online spaces. And, you know, is that good? Is that bad? Does that work? You know? Yeah. You know, it's that's... also I mean, there's just a larger community issue of, you know, just uh, a, a lot of communities. Well, I mean, most communities in general are wrestling with this and that the, 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 the crisis in um, real estate, the fact that space yes. has become so prohibitively expensive means that nobody has a space to join. And space is so important, like the what they call like a third place in in in. Uh, city planning, you've got your like your work, your home, and you need like a third place to hang out that doesn't work or home. <laughs> just well, so you and can of be course, somewhere else sometimes. what's demolished that but the pandemic? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Now we don't yeah. even have the first two spaces. They're, they're, they're <laughs> this blur of, you know, and so it's like, okay, so now my home is everything. You know, and so we're hanging out in Jared's Seattle kitchen in a virtual, in a virtual sense. <laughs> Absolutely, where he's mi have... mixing his sticky dough. Yeah, so watching him get like larger and stickier the entire time. <laughs> I think this is Rebecca who's commenting. This is such a re relatable experience, Dave. Uh, my Gen X queer friends and I often argue about which which bar was where and when. It's, it's oh, like yeah. as soon as they disappear, you're like, but it was. Wait, yeah. it was, no, it was. <laughs> well, particularly if you have, often as you do in, in queer neighborhoods, you have like a row of places that are approximately the same age. They look mm. more or less the same at their storefront. They're structured more. So was it this one? Was it this one? Yes. Was it this? And, then, and for me, there was like, okay, it was upstairs. Well, once you actually get to the point of it being upstairs, well, it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in this neighborhood. There are stairs leading up to any number of things, you know? So you just basically look and think, okay, well, what's a set of stairs that I wouldn't have felt like I was going to get killed going up? So, <laughs> so, you know, and that's, of course, the whole other part of queer history and queer spaces is that a lot of them, 
in the 70s 80s even early 90s were shady and dangerous yeah, <laughs> they yeah. were in shady and dangerous places they were run by shady and da- or owned by shady and dangerous people and so and you always felt if you were going to a new spot like am i going to be in peril because of the mm. neighborhood or because people have targeted it one of my first experiences in a gay space in Winnipeg was a private club, because, of course, things had to be private clubs, uh, called Happenings, that was downstairs from a straight disco. And uh, the, the I think it was either the first or second time that I went there. And I was, like, newly out. I was newly able to drink. I was newly able to go to a place like this. It was, uh, they called it a, bar, a bomb threat. And to this day, oh I, think, I think the police actually created their own bomb threat so that they could show up and they could ID everybody and they Mm. could march everybody out. And we were all terrified that we were going to be going out to a bunch of queer bashers. It was Mm -hmm. a really frightening experience. And yet, and like that was one of the signature experiences of my coming out. And that was Mm -hmm. not by any means unique either in Winnipeg or elsewhere. So, um, so that too was that whole thing of like, you know, from early on my social life was married to like this sense of danger yeah so people want to know why i write horror and queer horror (laughs) (laughs) there it is i'm laying it right out for you jared i just i just want to jump in here and ask jared how how it's going we see see a mushy mass appearing it is Uh, a little too moist still so i'm kind of slapping it around until it so this is this is interesting because there's sort of neither cakes nor cookies uh that uh i'm familiar with are usually needed but you are needing this and it does contain yeast so it's sort of going to be it's going to be kind of like a bready like a very thin bread yeah sort of like a soul bun David, so we'll catch you. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you feel like by by working on this book that you are becoming also like a queer historian as well as a novelist, or well... did all that work show you that you, <laughs> that, you, that you don't want to be a historian? Yeah, I mean, I worry. I mean, someone today it was really it was endearing actually. Someone today um, on Twitter asked me about uh, the first section of the Bone Mother and was like, hmm. "Oh, the bit with the brother and you know marrying his husband. what what." Uh, what uh, what legend is that based on? And I'm like, dude, I just made it up. <laughs> I just, fully, fully a third of that book is made up. Fully a third of that book. That's is why it's so of, good. Is yeah, fairy, I... It's fairy tale and folklore that's gathered from a variety of places. And then a third of it is quite Eastern European, if not mm-hmm. literally so, then certainly in flavor. And and the pro and I, my fear was, and I thought right away, as soon as the reviews started coming in, you're going to have a whole bunch of people thinking, oh, it's some kind of ethnographic thing, right? And it's Go like, Lord. no, no, no. No, no, no. Do not use my book as as research for anything. There's not, there's not that society that's like policing the monsters this in real life. This is how the Ukrainians did it. Yeah, but I mean, it's just it's just folly to like go into something that's clearly labeled fiction that isn't yeah. some sort of a survey mm-hmm. of actual things and go, oh, I love this. This must be a real legend. No, 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 no. I mean, I with with um, with Red X, I really tried to be true to like a lot of people have asked you know what's true and what's not in the book and um you know certainly the the actual landmarks the actual bars the actual clubs those things were all as real as i could possibly make them out to be because i needed them to be real for me and then the stuff that's about the stuff that's autobiographical is until you get into the very final section where it's clear that i'm like I'm corresponding with fictional characters and things like that. <laughs> you know, all of the autobiographical stuff is absolutely truthful. There is right. one story involving my father where I fudged a little. And part <laughs> of that was because I couldn't remember. And the other part was I wanted something that would tie it in more f- firmly with what was going on in the rest of the book. But other than that, I was just ruthlessly real about myself and uh, and stuff that I'd gone through. But then when it came to like the fictional characters, the fictional characters are utterly fictional. And to a certain extent, mm-hmm. I wanted to make them a little bit aspirational. Like there was, I think there was one person who pointed out, oh, well, you know, you really wouldn't have had a, a black lesbian DJ working in gay male bars in Toronto at the time. And that's absolutely true. Like, you know, there were women who came later on mm-hmm. in sort of the late 90s and 2000s who I found really inspiring. Um, and I thought, oh, I love characters like that. I like, I, you know, I think it would be fascinating to write somebody like that. And so I just moved her into a point where 
you know, it was truly an anachronistic. It might have yeah, happened yeah. somewhere else. It might have happened in Europe. It might have happened in the U.S., but it would never have happened here. Hmm. Um, but uh, but I wanted someone who, you know, whose existence in the book would give people some hope so, <laughs> so that they weren't reading it and going, oh, my God, <laughs> it's just it's a nightmare. Everyone is dying. It's all so horrible. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. You know, so that was a and also I, I you know, I presented in the book with her um, uh, a trans woman named Salem who uh, ends up engaging in a relationship with her and they become kind mm -hmm. of the final girls of the book. <laughs> um, and I, and I, and I, I needed that for myself, you yeah. know, in order to be able to sort of, you know, move forward through it. And, mm -hmm. um, but so, you know, but, but I wouldn't want anyone to be sitting there going, Oh, you know, David said there was a, a trans group at the 519 and it was, <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I, I mean, really, the, probably. The, the slippage between fiction and, and reality is, is really one of the interesting things about the book that I really enjoy. That's where the fact that you're sort of like, you're sliding along and suddenly you're like, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is real. <laughs> wait a minute. Like Alexander Wood was a real guy and yep. wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, like... you know, a certain amount of the Alexander Wood stuff is absolutely true. Yeah. Stuff yeah. around Hellfire Clubs and, and, mm, and you mm -hmm. know, green rooms with that for Molly Houses and things like that they're not not true but they're not they're not a literal part of his history right so, right we don't know uh, for they sure. weren't just keeping a know. thing in a box uh -huh. yeah that, <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my other favorite ones was you know i there is a there is a torture device in the in the mm. book that figures prominently yeah. called a pie and um and you see it referred to in the book uh from the rhyme uh what used to be four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie is four and twenty naughty boys baked in a pie, and and the pie is basically like a kind of um, what are they? A bronze bowl, a brass bowl, whatever it was, where you put somebody in, you put coals underneath, and you cook them to death, effectively. It's just a terrifying um, way of killing someone. Absolutely, and of course, the pie is entirely made up. It is. <laughs> in, it is. It's in fact true that there is a version of the fair, of the uh, nursery rhyme four and twenty naughty boys baked in a pie, and it is huh. spelled P Y E. But mm. when I re encountered that, I thought, oh, wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> <laughs> what if I? What if that torture device? What if there was a torture device and it was called a pie? And I and I um, and so I made use of that, but. Um, someone asked me about it they were clearly like they were sort of going around the outside edge right they were like they didn't want to necessarily know that it wasn't real but, mm, yeah, but they yeah. had their suspicions and so they were like about the pie and i said yeah <laughs> yeah yeah t totally totally made up it was and, and it's there's just something like you, you you sort of you describe it with such matter of fact conviction that it's really yeah. i was like that could have been there's no reason that couldn't have been a thing. You know? <laughs> it could have been a thing. Well, and I had I'm it gonna... turn up in a crossword puzzle, which I thought was, oh my you goodness. Know, like, what better way to just have it just, you know, be established as a, as a point of fact, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so that was kind of fun to do. It's just, it's, but, but I think, I mean, if anything, I think the message is that um, queer history is not a remote, distant yeah far away thing it's not an unknowable thing uh queer history is first of all all around us but secondly is more recent than you realize certainly is more recent than i realize i now realize i'm part of queer history um mm -hmm. but um but is but is really difficult now to pin down because anything that is just beyond the invention of the internet has fallen into kind of a history hole. Yeah, yeah, a black and hole. this uh -huh. is and this is an example of that. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, and I think it's really important for people, as best they can, to try to do their own discovery around the history that matters to them, and to try to preserve it in whatever way they can, in order to be able to to establish some kind of continuum for us, because we are an, we are forever um, a, an endangered community. Absolutely. I'm, just, I'm looking at the rolling happening Yes, here. I'm looking at it too. Yeah. <laughs> now, is this thing going to rise? Um, I think a little bit, but not like... Um, it really is more like a flatbread than anything else. Okay. Premium, so. is so, your next project yeah. the final book in the trilogy, or is there going to be something else before that? Uh, no, that's the next thing I know about. He said vaguely. 
<laughs> that, that's the next thing that I signed a contract for. <laughs> okay. Is that already written? Yeah, I handed it in September 30th, and it almost yeah. killed me. Go team. Yay. Yeah. So for me, when the, does the book it come that, out? Um, we're saying spring 2022 because of supply chain issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So the book that I, I read of yours uh, just before you um, just before the show, so I would know what we were talking about, has this amazing cover. Yes, it's see. gorgeous. Yes, I uh, love the cover. So good. <laughs> what if Audubon um, was goth? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and what would what's what's scary about your books, Primi? What would what, what, how would you describe what are the primal fears that you're playing on there, or do you think of them as scary? I I didn't think of the books that are classified of as horror that I didn't think of them as horror, like like John yeah. pointed out. Huh. Um, I thought they might have some scary elements in them, but I also don't think that having the characters be scared makes a horror novel. Mm -hmm. so hmm. i don't actually like i don't read a lot of horror and i don't watch a lot of horror movies and i'm very much of the opinion that you kind of can't create what you don't take in because hmm. you don't know how other people are doing it like i couldn't sit down and write a mystery i don't read mysteries hmm. and anyone who read that and the editor who got it would be like ah, da, 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 da. No. No. <laughs> what is no, what is this, this isn't how they go you did everything wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know that that's true. I mean, I on, true, on both but... sides. I mean, I think that with horror, we all have our own fears and anxieties. And I think if we populate our work with them, it doesn't really matter if we're engaged with horror popular culture or or the or the mainstream genre category that we describe as horror. There's a lot of horror I would say there's a lot of there's a lot of we'll say this well there's a lot of fiction with fiction with horror elements that exists outside the genre that I still think of as horror, and um, I mean the most notorious one I suppose is Beloved um, mm. by Toni Morrison, which we are now reclaiming as literary horror sort of many years after the fact because it, it's going it's through so, a, a banning uh, uh, yeah which right is now. also yeah. amazing you know mm -hmm. um, because it's graphically violent as a number of her books are because it has supernatural aspects as a number of her books do um, and because it has such an overt ghost story I mean so much so that the first time I read it <laughs> um, I stopped about I don't know 40 or 50 pages in because the ghost story was so overt and so obvious and I thought well, you characters are all stupid if you don't know what's going on. <laughs> what's wrong with you people? But of course, it's it's beyond and above what that is. And um, and so so I think um, I think I mean obviously horror. Part of part of the problem with horror is that it's a marketing term. So it's about mm -hmm. publishers and readers trying to find a place where your book fits in with other books that they consider to be like books, so that they can you know, buy something this way that they really like and avoid something they don't. But I think as an individual experience, I think you're as capable of writing horror or as capable of writing a mystery as people who have put their entire careers into either, you know, a kind of a templated approach that isn't necessarily yours. So, I mean, I certainly see horrific elements in your work. Um, if you but don't. also, <laughs> it's got. But it's got. I mean, one of the things I enjoyed about your book was that it's. You know, I, I also found. I mean, there's this. There's this backdrop of of climate apocalypse, but there's also this. Uh, you know, family dynamic between the protagonist and her mom that I found really compelling. It was like, come for the climate apocalypse, stay for her fights with her mom. You know, <laughs> there's a it was actually intended to be kind of the other way around. It's, you know, come for the very small human story. Yeah, and. Pay no attention to the backdrop of this being kind of a post-apocalypse. Yeah. Post right. But also to get back, I guess, to what we were mm. just talking about. Um, I don't know. I When I say I don't think I read horror, I mean, like, for the purposes of things like my book being pulled into something for an awards category. Right. So where I wouldn't consider mm. it to be horror, somebody did. So now the book is up for a horror award rather than a sci-fi or fantasy award, that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> so... Uh, it's, it is part of being, you know, it's, it's part of like respecting the community that is going to consume what you write. Right. Yeah. 
Um, you worry but, also that that'll pigeonhole what people expect from you in the future? That they'll uh, it definitely has them. already, yeah. because mm -hmm. I know uh, earlier this summer, someone read uh, the book that I had out in July. Wow, it's been a long year. Um, <laughs> uh, and was like, uh, wh which is, uh, you know, a dystopian future hmm. story. Uh, and was like, oh, this wasn't a cosmic horror. I'm like, I don't just write cosmic horror. <laughs> Stop being stupid for two minutes. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if I am getting pigeonholed, I think that's unfortunate because hmm. that's not all I write and it's not all I want to write. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't, in my mind, when I think of you, think of you as a horror writer. I think of you as like a speculative fiction writer. Yeah. Um, I like to, we just like to tease you about the horror thing because you're so adamant that you don't write horror. I'm like, <laughs> Well, maybe but, um... I do. I don't know. <laughs> Look at these cakes with the X's appearing on them. Yes. Jared, you, you didn't put, you didn't put raisins or currants or anything in these. these I'm are... about to. Oh, you are. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to put go. them in the X's. Oh, that's Shutted clever. Little that little works nicely. Currants. Um, a pre uh, premium. Another thing I wanted to ask you about was that the the, the um the 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 book that sorry <laughs> uh, annual migration of clouds. Sorry, it was like the the title. I could see the, I could see the image, and suddenly the title <laughs> flown out of my brain. Um, is uh it's quite it's quite short. It's a novella, and I know you have like a couple other books out that are novellas, and that's I would imagine um like in 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 speculative fiction there's a lot of world building, and so like usually people take like these massive tomes that are you know like uh, fantasy series that go on for like eight volumes, so they can just like get all that world building in there, and so this is a very compressed <laughs> form in which to do this. And <laughs> how do you how do you feel about that? How is it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That? I'm actually um. In a couple of weeks here, I'm supposed to be teaching a workshop on world building and speculative fiction. Huh. And I'm very excited about that. Um, and I, I have a lot of imposter syndrome about it because <laughs> as you point out uh, with novellas, and this is my third novella this year, uh, it just it's hard to get what I think of as that kind of world building that people talk about in essays and podcasts and um, workshops. And, you know, there are people who run courses about, ooh, sorry, I'm looking at the, the cross. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, been it's happening cool. in the background. Uh, it's, it's kind of hypnotic. Um, <laughs> uh, while, of course, being personally very repellent to me, a vampire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, um, I guess, because I haven't written very much um, secondary world stuff, I tend to not think of what I write um, as world building because, you know, mm. I'm writing in the world. The world, world already exists. But of course, when you yeah. write the fact you are always building a world because it is in some way, has to be, different from the contemporary world in which we live. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess with a novella, the answer to that is um, comment on it and then kind of let the reader fill it in. <laughs> I also don't feel like I'm doing complicated world building in these mm -hmm. three books. Uh, that they that they don't require um, what I think of as the the sort of heavyweight world building of you know planets, uh, systems, economies, new governments. Um, they're they're all basically you know here, but set aside a little bit in time or space. Nice. And yet you introduce new elements, new bi uh, biological elements or, mm -hmm. or social elements that, that distort the world as we have it um, and take it into different paths and different directions. So, um, and that, I mean, that obviously that counts as world building, yeah. you know, to that extent. So, I mean, you know, which is cool, which is great. Yeah. But yeah again, and yeah, it's a... Uh... It's kind of tough to do economically. And every time I hand in a novel, I'm waiting for my agent or editor to be like, okay, well, I don't understand how this happened or what's going on here. Right. Um, can you expand on that? And I'd be like, no, because we're too close to the party house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I want to focus the novella. I don't want to keep it a miniature novel. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want me to expound on it uh, more, uh, the answer is uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> 
do something about it. And so far they haven't, which is terrible. Like, <laughs> or which is terrific. Which is terrific. <laughs> I like, I mean, I, I, I enjoy that because I like it when things are underexplained and I just have to kind of accept it and roll with it. <laughs> it has to fill it in, you know, as a reader. It engages you more, I think, if you yeah, have to connect think, the dots yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. there are a lot of readers that, uh, that enjoy that. Yeah. And they don't mm -hmm. want to be spoon fed everything. Yeah. And yeah. anyway, I can't write epic fantasy. So And that's what I like so much about your world building and, and oh, what you. can we offer you tonight? <laughs> is that yeah. it was like this it was like this fever dream that you were going into and there's all these all aesthetics no and things that are old and crumbling <laughs> and have passed away. And so you kind of are rebuilding the 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 shared history of the city along with the character as they are also making it up in their own minds from what they're experiencing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and somebody I was talking to somebody on Twitter about this at the time too. It's even even mentioning like the like the canals. Clearly this is in the future. Um I didn't say that, you know, climate change caused global flooding and sea levels to rise and all these cities are flooded now. Um maybe that's not what happened. Maybe this was a city hmm. that was designed to have canals or Maybe it wasn't, and this is just what they have to put up with, and they hate it. Yeah, and, I thought. You know, I, always, I don't my, think I my need mind. to put that in there. It's just you know, there's canals, and they're bad, and there's big fish in them. Yeah, um, yeah, just yeah, roll with it. <laughs> yeah, my, my mind it came from like that god goddess like cathedral and stuff. That's what I yeah. I did want to ask you about the there's uh, one 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 element in um, the, the, the migration of clouds is this the sentient fungus that you know yes. takes up residence <laughs> they always use the word semi i don't know how accurate that is and i was just that was like such a that. such a fascinating idea and so unsettling and i was wondering if that was like did that is there is that based on anything that happens in the natural world is oh that, yeah yeah, yeah that's it. based on a zillion things that happen oh, in the natural world which i think we should talk about while we are yeah. watching cooking and like <laughs> describe some horrifying I will, well they're not that horrifying it's just uh, the entire yeah. idea literally came from a single tweet um it just flew down my timeline while i was doom scrolling as one does mm -hmm. and uh it just said um hereditary symbiont and i was like oh that's so cool <laughs> uh, and I leapt off and like two days later I had this disease you know cooked up and then I came back and I'm like what are they talking about um I hadn't even read I didn't read the paper that they were talking about okay. I assume I didn't then I couldn't find it again obviously oh, no. I think they were talking about Wolbachia um hmm. which is a hereditary symbiont of arthropods and uh literally affects your reproductive fitness so if you an insect have Wolbachia, this, this bacteria <laughs> that lives as a symbiont with you, and you have babies, and you don't manage to give this to your babies, those babies won't be able to reproduce. Oh. Um, it's yeah. a very complicated system. They found it in a ton of insects so far. As far as they it's know, it's kind of like DRM for insects. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like DRM for insects. <laughs> um, you know, and there's also toxoplasmosis, which changes the behavior of things. There's lots of other parasites. That do yeah. that there's the cordyceps fungus which was used in mr carries the girl with all the gifts which um yeah. i read part of but didn't finish it's um, the one with the, the, the fungus that controls ants and makes them yeah, yeah. And, it, and yeah. that's the thing it changes their behavior hmm. and it does and for a lot of these parasites particularly some of the flatworms and flukes it changes the behavior in a way that is so distinctive and immediate that researchers just watching a couple of minutes of like video footage of animals infected or not infected with it can tell which is which like immediately, um, which is gross and interesting. But a lot of where <laughs> that was coming from was very much sort of, you know, toxoplasmosis. Do we know mm. for sure that it doesn't change human behavior? Do we know mm. that it doesn't make people more or less risk averse? Do we know that it's not changing our thoughts? Um, and it's the, a lot of this also came from Ed Yong's book, I Contain Multitudes. I don't know if you guys have read that, yeah. fascinating, but mm. again, the idea that you can change somebody's gut flora yep. and literally give them clinical depression because your gut flora also makes serotonin and dopamine and several other neurotransmitters. And our idea of ourselves as a single person with free will and a mind of our own and memories of our own and the ability to control our actions voluntarily is true-ish. <laughs> like we're actually a community and we don't have yeah. any control about what lives inside of us no. and i thought the idea of this infection that's basically a parasite um that's trying to propagate itself and keep the host alive i don't know i thought that was really interesting but then of course i had disease and no plot so then yeah. i kind of had to write a book about it 
<laughs> in Canadian literature, you don't need anything That's like right. a plot. Go <laughs> right ahead. Right Especially because if you're on the prairies, so you get <laughs> yes, Canadian exactly. prairie. You're, you're supposed to have a bear, though. I was. I tried oh, to well, out that's true. Bear, but... I've read that book. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the really annoying thing is? It's actually a good book. Like, it didn't age terribly really well in terms of, like, the, you know, the sexual dynamics with that guy. Yeah. But in terms of it being, like, kind of an interestingly written, beautifully yes. set story where you can like kind of hear the birds and like the water moving on the lake and i don't know mm -hmm. uh it's the, 70, the, 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 the 70s or 80s cover has aged very, very yeah. Big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> when it originally came amazing. out in hardcover it did not have the very saucy look that it has right now the new cover is back to being boring yeah. there's like a really hard to find <laughs> cover that looks like like a like a seventies fantasy cover, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild, the bear, that's the know. one. That's the one that was on my parents' bookshelf when I was growing up. Yeah. <laughs> I had one of ours from the library and was like. And someone just <laughs> tweeted in to say that, uh, or messaged in to say that nature is the, uh, is the, the ultimate horror author. The yeah. ultimate horror author. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you don't even need thirty to fifty feral hawks. You could go for like a lot fewer feral hawks. Oh yeah, hawks. yeah. And that's that's what this is what I like about the 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 whole um yeah was what is symbiotically controlling your behavior because it's a little bit I mean it's it's a little bit like the idea of of zombies but it's much more insidious and subtle you know like if mm -hmm. someone if someone becomes a zombie you know they're a zombie like clearly it's <laughs> yeah. not your brother anymore <laughs> he's been by the zombie and he's like this and he's going brains you know it's like it's, it's horrifying, but it's you know there's a clear division where the idea the idea that this could sort of be so subtle that you are you're not even sure and people around you aren't even sure is it you or is it the fungus talking you know that's yeah. like that's creepy. Well, <laughs> part of another thing where that came from too was uh, learning about you know prion diseases <laughs> when yeah, I was in yeah. my first degree. <laughs> 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 uh, you know the idea that you could have um, you know mad cow disease or. Mm. or FFD or whatever, uh, FFI, sorry, or whatever. And, yep. you know, it's just hanging out yep. in there and you don't know if you have it or not because you can't check until you die. I just, yeah, I didn't like that. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get behind that. Uh, which is great because prion diseases don't care if you can't get behind that or not. And now they do any other infections. No. No. That we know of. That we that know we of. Know of. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, I was thinking um like when when I was when I was prepping for this that I I I'm not a huge I I would not call myself like a a big horror head, a horror aficionado, but I I do enjoy horror, but for me it's usually like if I'm watching a horror movie, I will pick something, I will deliberately pick something that's about like demon possession or mm -hmm. a right. cursed mirror or something something that i'm really not scared of in real mm -hmm. life so i can be like oh for 90 minutes i can forget all about like things that i'm really scared of like police <laughs> violence and climate change <laughs> and just kind of immerse myself in a world where i kind of have the experience of being scared of this thing and then it's over and i'm like well yep. that was fun um <laughs> see, so yeah so like reading reading your your books it's like <laughs> Here are my here are actual here are real fears. fears. <laughs> First of all, well, rude. Exactly. Maybe, maybe that exactly. is one of the uh, maybe that's one of the uniting factors is that maybe the things that we should be scared of are the things that are closest to us. Yeah, Which isn't yeah. to say that whole you know uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. It's that <laughs> maybe the things that are around you that you consider to be part of you being safe and secure are not that at all. No. So now you have to leave them and go find something else that's safe. And that's, you know, that's hard. That's, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. It's a pat of butter. What's happening? This is a pat of butter. Look, it's Southern. <laughs> it's just butter. <laughs> <laughs> on on the, like the, the topic of the type of horror that you like to watch, like my pet yeah. peeve is when a horror movie promises you supernatural and at the end it's like, the real evil is man. I'm like, <laughs> I, like, I would have fucking watched the news if I wanted to get depressed about humanity. Give me something weird. I'm here for the weird, man. Yeah. yeah. I don't want fuck to be off with guy. like humans being horrible to humans. I see that when I go to the store. And it's also like, oh, wait a minute. 
were we the monster? Were we the, was the real monster whoa. in us all along? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Yeah. The real <laughs> monster is the audience for watching this. <laughs> yes. That was, that's a popular that's, trend that's as funny well. Games. I that's fucking hate that, funny that funny idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny games was good for that. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you're implicated. You, you, you. <laughs> Are you happy, are there, sickos? Are there, <laughs> are there horror here? things, horror tropes, or horror subgenres that the horror authors can't watch because they're too upsetting? I'll mm. go first. I can't watch Home Invasion. Mm. I really can't. I yeah. like The Strangers has been sitting there for a long time, and I just <laughs> like the thought, oh, yeah, people in masks coming into my house that I can't see who are coming to kill me. I cannot do that. Yeah, I that's the one that gets that me. One. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, all, like real, ever since I watched my list. that <laughs> French film Fat Girl, like oh I've, yes, that ending, like yeah. like that's been burned into my brain, and that is now one of my like prime fears is like <laughs> sleep, the sitting, doing nothing, all of a sudden something just kills you because because like the chaos of humanity. Of yes, exactly. You know, that's why drunk people are more terrifying than anything else because you don't you can't yes. rationalize or or. Yeah. gauge what's about to happen yeah it's mm -hmm. random behavior yeah mm. and so the random violence is, is a, of home invasion is one that like actually terrifies Chris me says, in what about life. home alone <laughs> <laughs> home alone is secretly a horror movie <laughs> i mean th there's a caveat where like if the movie is about like the the person being home invaded actually slipping the tables and like just annihilating the annihilators then i like it but if yeah. it's like one of those like every they die and there's there's helplessness mm. and like yeah. yeah I I just I'd rather go watch something else you know mm. like I have we have limited time on Earth I'm never gonna be able to watch all the good <laughs> horror movies why should I watch one that I don't want yeah. to <laughs> yeah I don't know. Else, anything you hate? everything else is on it's it's like a single woman of color living alone. Everything in a horror movie is on my list. <laughs> like, yeah. Every, like, after, do you remember, like, did anyone watch the X-Files when they were first on TV in their initial, ish, oh, initial yeah. run and just, like, have nightmares for, like, the entire week after the Fluke Man episode? Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. The, the witch and episode gave me nightmares for weeks. Several yeah. of them gave me nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just, like, that slow realization that, no, okay, not just that I was extremely sheltered, but... Um, you know, once you see something like this in a horror movie or read something like this in a horror book, that's it. You can't forget it. You yeah. have seen it. You can't unsee it. That is now part of the internal carnival of fears. It's a ride now. So your yeah. brain is just going to go and ride on that whenever it wants. And like I had friends who convinced me to watch the TV series Hannibal. And then I spent like six months afraid of every goddamn thing in the world. I was afraid of <laughs> like beds. Bedrooms, ceilings, houses, cabins, uh, rivers, the sea, most foods. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was debating was whether I would have to spend the next several months living off like triscuits and apples. <laughs> I mean, the thing Hannibal really Apparently made Hannibal me... Hannibal doesn't eat triscuits, I don't think. The thing Hannibal made me terrified of is two <laughs> hot men not kissing before they fall off a cliff. Yeah, like that. That's that, that's the biggest that. fear of mine. That like there'll be two just dudes are into each other and then they just don't care. That also gave me a fear of the, <laughs> the more the tragedy simple, than her. I think it was like what was it like three or four episodes where um, Will Graham has like severe encephalitis and has basically for all intents and purposes, plot purposes mostly, lost his mind. Nobody <laughs> believes him. Everybody tries to convince him that he's doing things he's not doing or didn't do things that he did do. And those really horrified me too. Just the idea that you could be protesting. No, no, that wasn't me. I didn't, I swear, I absolutely, Ooh. and everyone around you is like, nope, we're locked yeah. up. One of the yeah. only, one of the only tropes in horror that actually scares me is the loss of power and agency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like anytime yeah. it's like someone in a hospital and like the doctors are gaslighting them that just makes me freak the fuck out. Me like, too. cause like, that's like me a too. huge fear is like you put yourself in these power and then they're like, you can't go home. Yeah. Like you're crazy now. Like we signed yeah. the paper. It's like, no, no, fuck that. Like, <laughs> I mean, I always get like, why don't you like punch this person in the face and run? But yeah, there's a lot of reasons, you know, like yeah. that's yeah. just writing. Well, yeah. and that's, I'm like, that's I'm so not much horror for me too, gonna... is that the people, the people in the horror movie have lost agency because the villain yeah. is so much 
bigger or stronger or more numerous mm. or whatever than them. They yeah. have no agency. All they can yeah. do is like react. Yeah. And it, then for me to like sit there and watch that, no thanks. No, 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 I'll have nightmares. <laughs> and that's why I like it when it's supernatural because there is mm. something very attractive in um, transgressive about allowing yourself to lose agency like to something that's like devouring you or something <laughs> like putting your point <laughs> yourself in the in the in the cat their shoes and like normally we're built to protect ourselves and like not be eaten and for like this taboo moment you get to like revel in losing that agency without it doing anything and that's why i like it when it's supernatural but when it's humans and in a real setting mm -hmm. then it's just like scary as opposed to like yeah. this this like thing i get to experience you know well, like <laughs> i think this is one of the i think this is one of the things that drove some people bonkers about about hereditary which is mm. that so much of it is human based so little of it is supernatural but it's clear from the way the story is being told that everything that's going on in the story is fated the characters have no agency whatsoever mm. they are just going through a series of motions and even if something happens that seems to rob somebody of uh it seems to empower somebody beyond the agency. Nope, that's not going to happen. It's going to be cut off at the knees. And I think for a lot of, particularly a lot of horror writers who like to have their characters have some element of power and some element of control, some way of resisting, um, it was frustrating watching that movie and having characters just be put into a machine that they were never going mm -hmm. to be able to escape from. And and all you could do is watch and go, okay, well, what kind of machine is that? <laughs> you know, what well, are that's the what details of this machine? Yeah, wasn't that? It was that the machine that they were put into was filled with red herring. Yeah, you know, like yeah. it was just like really, to me, cheap storytelling where they're gonna like introduce all these weird set pieces and then never address them and they have no impact on the on the story. No, because the story I kept waiting that whole fucking movie set. for the little model sets. To yeah. have something to do with the movie because like we showed yeah. them for for 50% of the screen time we were looking at the model sets and it's like oh no that's just her job it's like well it's her job and it's, you, but man. It's, that's it's, it's her job and it's her psychology I mean that's that's the one thing that I'll say in 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 defense of those is that was her trying to sort of own what was going on in her past without her really understanding what had been going on mm -hmm. and it was her way of trying to exert control through her art as imperfect as that was meanwhile in her life everything is appears to be anyway just haywire <laughs> in comparison but i mean for I mean, us at least the ending yeah had a great ending that's all i had to that one <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna pause and, and check in with jared who is actually sitting yes. down now so what's can... happening you've made <laughs> a little <laughs> egg wash or something yeah yeah what's... these soul cakes are baking yes and i'm about to make the funeral cakes i'm just waiting a little bit for the butter to cool down uh, so I have to melt it. So, so that's why so I'm just sitting here doing nothing. Oh, While cool. you're sitting there doing nothing, uh, yeah. you also wrote a horror novel. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to talk about that? <laughs> this is fucking um, news to me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> talk about that. yeah. Yes, we're leading well, in. Jared's <laughs> about to be up in trouble with three of his friends. <laughs> well, it's, on, it's on your Wait. Patreon. <laughs> well, that's the thing. What are you referring to? I'm talking about the thing How many horror Patreon. novels have you written, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking not about the one that many. is on your Patreon that I haven't read now. That I, I have not read. Oh, so the I don't one you haven't? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, it's on Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Actually, it's more than halfway done now. It's not that long. I mean, okay. is it horror? It's horror, right? It's it's kind horror. Of... Yeah. It's horror. Okay. So what's it it, what's scary about your, your horror novel? A, I might have read a piece of it because <laughs> I went to your Patreon recently, so I might have read a bit of it, and it was good. No, tell so us about it, Jared. Jared, tell us about it. <laughs> um, it's oh god, I I never have an elevator pitch for this one because I can't remember. <laughs> Like it, it changed a lot, so some, there's some things that are like not true about it anymore. Um, okay. It's about a town in the north of England, which spookily enough, I didn't know was real. I made up the name. Uh oh. And then after <laughs> getting like, halfway through it, was like, wait, I should look and see if this is a real thing. And it. <laughs> How much awesome. of the story matches Very the real spooky. thing? Um, and it starts getting replaced by a different 
town, a darker version of itself. Oh, I love oh, that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I love that. Yep. Um, <laughs> populated by entities that, spoiler, I suppose, you never find out what their deal is because nobody is capable of understanding, you know? Oh, okay. But not, not in like a, oh, tentacles Lovecraft kind of way. It's just like whatever, whatever people think or write about them alters what they are. So it changes th how things work. Mm. Um, and the, the plot is, oh, it's kind of like Dracula where it's being put together by a person who's in the story trying to mm. figure out what's happening. Okay. Um, and it's also, it's uh, like, like Bone Mother. It has unsettling historical photographs that. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I, start, like, I, I support a lot of my friends' Kickstarters, but I don't look at the content because there's so much of it. So yeah. like, I just, I just like, I pledge and I'm like, I want to support you, but like, I never go and look. I just like, when they have a book, I'll read it, you know, when it comes out. But if you're putting up fake photographs and horror stories, I'm going to have to start <laughs> turning back on that RSS feed. <laughs> <laughs> And you think well, just, you're about half done? Um, more than that. Okay. So How many put, words just putting out do you the... think you have? How many words? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. It changed. That's one of those things that changed because I went okay. through a while ago and just, you know, rewrote the whole thing, as you do. Yeah. So you replaced um, it with a darker version of itself. Yeah. I did. I did, actually. Because <laughs> originally what it was was more like... That's what happens. <laughs> kind of like the Bone Mother, actually, more like a loose collection of short stories in a way. Not that the, right. I mean, that's not quite what the Bone Mother is, but no. you know, each chapter is yeah. of its own thing that sort of episodic, connects yeah. to the large whole. Um, but I went through and took a lot of that structure out, so it's more contained. And then the the narrative voice, the narrator, starts becoming more and more of the action as she's trying to control what's going on. Ah, uh, cool. Cool. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm publishers gonna... need to get over the Patreon and just not consider that first rights. Like, no, <laughs> just yeah. get over it, guys. It, it's no. not first rights. Like, no, <laughs> no it's I'm a just going to put where... out to the universe, just in, and the uh, and Twitch and whoever is is listening that Jared needs an agent. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would say so. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. My agent uh, reps Cassandra Kaw, and they write really. Or, Oh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, and me, obviously. And yep. uh, Darcy and Little Badger <laughs> and uh, Nick Mamatas. Uh, so, maybe this could be up his alley if he's watching and it's not <laughs> easy stuff to Good. get me more money. Michael, are you watching? <laughs> Anyways. Link twice. If you're not, what am I paying you for? <laughs> oh, yes. you, you, could, you could have Jared. I'm really easy to work with. Work with. I'm, I'm easy to work with. You could have yeah. Jordan too. Jordan, yeah. Yes, Jordan. Yes. Also not taken. Jordan on the ask list also. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this leads into uh, uh, another thing I wanted to ask you guys about, which is um, not to, not to a huge degree, but but Jared and David, you collaborated a little bit in in Red X. We did. Uh, you got, you got yeah. those illustrations, and can you talk about how that happened and what the process was? Oh, for sure. Um, so of course I had seen um, Jared's uh, illustrations online for quite a while um, while I was writing um, the early part of Red X, and and I reached out to him and I said. I think I would like this book to have illustrations, you know, much in the same way that I had thought, you know, that I went into Bone Mother knowing that there was going to be a, a visual component to it. And I said, I'm not really sure what they are yet, but are, would you be able to do so? And he said, yes. And he was quite open to it. There were some things that I knew right away that I wanted. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll get those out of the way. And, um, and one of them is an illustration of um, a masked nude man uh, he's hooded, actually, and it's based on a, a photograph of uh, someone I know um, wearing that hood. And I thought, I really want this image, even though it's not absolutely directly connected to the content in the book, it has the right feel. And so mm. I asked him to do a rendering of that, basically. And then there was another one, which, of course, is the notorious image of me on the back of the book, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where people get to learn a lot about me. And, um, and, so, um, and so I, uh, and I asked him for that as well. 
there was a point where I thought that I was going to have illustrations of a number of torture devices, and mm -hmm. those ended up getting scrapped, which is unfortunate because, in fact, I loved those, and I may still use them for something. I um, still got that lying around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were they were really cool. I um, and so and so we did those as well, and there were a couple of other illustrations of the um, the main uh, antagonist in the book, Nicholas, um, mm -hmm. that also didn't make it in. Um, and mm -hmm. um, but it was but one of the things that was really cool about it, uh, quite apart from what was published and what wasn't published, was the fact that they did a lot to make some things in my mind concrete and were things that I could use as reference points when right. I was writing and rewriting throughout. And that was, and it turned out to be uh, an important part of my process. So, hmm. um, so I'm extremely grateful to Jared for them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that was, I, I, I suspect I'm start, I've started a new book and I suspect that there's going to be some kind of visual component to that as well, but it has not yet materialized so i'm just remaining open to whatever it is it's going to be right right yeah yeah but it's, i really it's enjoyed neat. the 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 images in, in bone mother those were where did you find those they were for anyone not familiar with them they're, very, they're these very enigmatic enigmatic's a good word <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> they this was this was one of those things where i at the very beginning of the process had set out some some rules for myself, uh, some constraints, I guess, that would help me sort of uh, shape what I was going to be doing. And one of the things that I had never done was write with prompts. And um, originally, um, the work that, uh, that I did that turned into The Bone Mother, originally it was a play. And I had wanted to work with projections. And so hmm. for me, it was like, I would really like to have an image that I could project of a person and I would like to have someone quite different be the performer. And you just, you know, looking at the image that this is the person who is speaking. And that gives you a lot of flexibility when it comes to actors and casting and stuff like that. So, because um, there are like 25 characters who speak in The Bone Mother, um, a minimum of 25 characters. So um, keeping track of people was an important thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I thought to myself, well, I know that it's going to be sort of Ukraine slash Romania. I know it's going to be around the Second World War. I wonder if there were any portrait photographers that I would be able to uh, find some work by. And so I literally went on to mm. Flickr <laughs> and went into their Creative Commons section. And I just typed, you know, Ukrainian wartime photographer or something like right. that. And up came, and he wasn't Ukrainian, he was Romanian, up mm. came um, Kostika Xente. His entire archive was oh. being digitized and put on uh, Flickr at the time, and it was being made available um, um, in the public domain. Um, and, and I looked at them all, and there were hundreds of photos, but there were many of them that were taken in this admittedly terrible photo studio with this terrible backdrop. And there were, and it was a mix of people who were, I would say, reasonably well off and terribly destitute. And, mm -hmm. um, and they all had this, you know, sort of look about them because mm -hmm. there was this consistency in how they were set. And I, th I saw those and I thought, I will easily find all of the people I want in these photographs. Yeah. And so I, I chose about 50 to start with and I printed them out and just sort of laid them out on the floor. And I started taking images um, and, and started writing the short pieces with the images as the inspiration. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I had about 15 or so, I thought, okay, 15 or 20, I thought, okay, what haven't I covered? What have I, what do I have too few of? What do I have too many of? And then I sort of rebalanced stuff that way. And, um, and it worked really, really well for something I had never tried before and didn't think would work. Well, didn't know whether it would work at all. It was a really, it was a really interesting risk to take. Mm. Um, it paid mm -hmm. off almost immediately. I could tell right away within the first three or four of them that some of this was the best writing I'd ever done. And it was like, Okay, <laughs> let's just keep going. So, nice. um, so yeah, so that's how that came about. And 
And I think it's a really interesting way to work. Um, I haven't done it since. I should probably do it again um, because it just it brings a lot of really interesting material out. Even if you don't end up using the image, even if you just use the image as as sort of like you know a reference point, yeah. um, a you can point. you can find a voice really fast. You can get a re sense mm -hmm. of character very quickly because it's not just the face. You also have clothing. You have the period. Yeah. You have a lot to draw on, and and it sets aspects of your imagination loose in a way mm -hmm. that um, you don't necessarily necessarily have if you have to make it all up. You There's know. just something much uh, I, I always find, and I'm I <laughs> I have I've done a little bit of writing. I I not really I, I can't speak from the kind of experience that you guys have, but just when you're trying to come up with ideas in general, it's always easier to move from the concrete than yes. it is to start with an abstraction. So if you're if you're like, I want to think, I want to write something about fear of the unknown, you're just going to kind of sit there. But if you have like a photo of who is this woman holding this child? What is wrong? There's something wrong with the child. What is wrong oh, with yeah. the child? You know, off your, off your imagination goes, there we go. Yeah, there we go. exactly. I don't know exactly. what that is, but it looks unsettling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Explain yourself, Jordan. Explain um, yourself. <laughs> I, ma I make weird ephemera for my... Um, for my Patreon, and this mm -hmm. is going to be the next one where just it's going to be all stained and old when they get it, but right. you're just going to get like a haunted photograph in the mail. That is know? so haunted. And That's sometimes, sometimes they That's have like weird photograph. little like like fake <laughs> letters that go with them, like in the or like little like like a like a, a receipt that like is for some weird shit, you know. But it's not explained, so it's basically like mm. storytelling through inference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, That's absolutely. Interesting. Again, the reader gets to sort of connect things together, fill in the the missing information with their imagination. Here's one of the images. Uh, I'm not sure how well you saw. Oh, you'll see it okay. Oh, from yeah. the Bone Mother. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and this one, of course, was the woman who I chose to be Baba Yaga, essentially. Ah. And uh, and I just, when I got to that, I thought, oh, she's fantastic. <laughs> it's that sort of thing where you think, oh, it's so great to have Again, you know, something that you can base whatever it is that's in your mind on and just have the two of them, you know, your imagination and, and the concrete sort of meld together into this new form. It's really, it's quite nifty. Like, this is the oh, one that I sent out this. last time. So it's all like stained with tea. Oh, yeah. And it's like a woman yeah. wandering off into the ocean with all these dark oh, forms. Good. Yeah. And then it came with like this fake letter that's all like mm. I hand wrote, but then I scanned it and printed it and cut it up. Awesome. And the, the, talking about the inference part, like when, on the when you get this, there's a piece of tape covering this up. Mm. And if someone thinks to unpeel the tape, ah. underneath this says mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which of course I never did. Now I, I know. So I which which I love that. the idea that there's people <laughs> gathering. It's almost like I grew up playing a lot of adventure games. Right. Where yeah. it's like about solving riddles and getting things and like discovering it. So I'm basically building an inventory for like a, a one moment in, a, in an adventure game where you're figuring out a story if you can like put the things together, you know. <laughs> Which will yeah, never I... be recognized as a category to win any kind of writing award. So, no. <laughs> well, not, not, yeah, not really. It's strange that that's the way because there's some really innovative writing going on in that <laughs> in that field. I'm just going to say forever, it's but... bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a 3,000 word short story in the form of a live tweet thread last year um, that cannot that was be fantastic. Yeah, for a company that hired me as if I was an intern going through dr dossiers of well. papers of Dracula. Yeah. And so like fake person, fake photographs, like just going slowly, getting weirder and weirder. And then I'm like, it just is, I think, really gatekeeper and bullshit that that type of writing isn't considered a short story. No, mm -hmm. in a category mm -hmm. anywhere. You can you can enter it in perhaps some social media and web based um, awards categories, but most uh, of those are for. I marketing. want to be the fucking nebulas, man. I yeah. know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah, if you look at those, I am very too. I am very upfront with I want to be recognized. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah. my no, goal. I totally you know? get it. Not, I mean, to, like, you have not to hang out with myself nebulas. for right things. <laughs> well, no, you know, I was just saying, you know, like the fact that you can win a Hugo for the previous year's Hugo speech. 
which yes. isn't even like really? a thing. But not oh, a yeah. short story written but in But not a short story written in tweets. I also no. think that's kind of huh. bullshit. And I think yeah. the categories should be more flexible than they are. And I don't yeah. want any of the big SF It should be like word count Awards and because they don't come you know, with giant like... checks. No. <laughs> I want one of the awards that comes with a big giant check. I want the prize. And I'm never going to do it if I keep writing spec thick. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I just, I want, I'm not in this to tell a story and the, punch what you just got to do I'm is in this for small amounts of cash so I can buy books. Yeah. yeah. You need to include just one character who is a white, middle aged literary professor having an affair with an intern. Ah! And yeah. then the rest of the book can be whatever it is, but they'll be like, That's this hard. is literary. That's hard right here. <laughs> you know what's really funny is I, I always hear people talking about that. They're like, oh, lit fic is about a middle aged English professor having an affair with a younger student. Then I ask them to read one Smith. of those books and they can't. Maybe one title where White teeth oh, by Zadie Smith. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Motley was one of the. The Autograph Man by Zadie have, Smith. You have, <laughs> you have, hey, is that a soul cake? Some oh of those goodness. were. Yeah. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, hey. that's really cool. That is cool. How does it taste? I don't know yet. Show it to find out. slowly for here us, Jared. Let's we'll like take the little lick for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do the tongue thing. Just eat it. Really make a meal out of it, as it were. Everybody on Twitch, start throwing those bits in right now. Jared's going to eat it slower and slower the more bits you pick. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, he froze. It was so powerful. It was so powerful, it knocked his soul out of his body. (laughs) Yeah. Is it good? Is it like a scony thing? No. Oh uh, <laughs> no, it's not it good. Like? Or in no, my mind, I imagine yeah. it's like it's like those little ginger cakes, you know. Like, like the... It's kind of like an English muffin, okay. Okay. like a really oh, spicy English muffin. But okay. it has that, that spongy texture. What kind of spices are in it? So there's um, does it have the air pockets? Oh yes, Clo- it does. It has. You can kind of show us the structure. I'm trying <laughs> to. Oh yeah. Oh wait a minute. It's Hold right, on. It's there, there in the go. little there. We're on camera. There we, we go. Are. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's more kind of a yeah, biscuity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is English yeah. muffin. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Doesn't have I don't think it rose enough. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Richard Harbody with the real questions. Yeah. <laughs> the dead bread. Yeah. Dead with bread. that dead bread <laughs> do know. With that dead bread. <laughs> <laughs> they got a little aerated, but not okay. enough. And I okay. feel hmm. like Part of that, maybe I just did something wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But also, definitely not just throwing the yeast in the beer like that. That could look, possibly. that's what it said to do. <laughs> that's what it said to do. Maybe you just you don't have, have enough to soul. The recipe. <laughs> maybe. But also, these are these are meant to keep. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Okay. I think they're not going right. to get big and spongy anyway. No. They're more oh, like yeah. hard tack biscuits. They might yeah. yeah. dry out. <laughs> but this little hard tack. <laughs> the flavor is Limba really, really is good. Sam. Oh, that's yeah. good. You said there was saffron and clove, and what else? Mace. So this is like for mace. fucking rich people. Yeah. <laughs> no, because it's only a little bit. So you could be a peasant and do it once a year. Yeah. Okay. You could be a peasant who stole a little saffron. bit from the kitchens of the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> could you grow your own saffron if you were a peasant, though? Like a, like a, few, a few strands? No. Enough no. To... <laughs> no. That was purely no, imported back then, right? Yeah. There is saffron grown in England, and I think there was back then, too. Oh, that's but it wasn't um, it wasn't widespread. It was only in like Cornwall or something. But you like got oh, your okay. hands cut off if you walked in that field. So yeah. <laughs> Jared, if you if you buttered it, if you drenched it in butter, would it be tasted? Would that be a good thing? If you covered it in white gravy. <laughs> 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 I'm I'm from Louisiana. I'm serious. Like if you cover yeah, that in sauce cover everything gravy. with white gravy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really I will say I really like the flavor. Okay. The sherry and the spices and the sugar. Ah, the sack. Sherry. Yes. Yeah, the sack. <laughs> the sack. <laughs> I actually didn't know that was sherry, and now I'm like going, my, my mind is like recalibrating all my repeated Ivanhoe reads as a teenager. Yeah. But they're just like, I always thought it was like some like weird beer, and now it's like they're drinking sherry. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that's this unreliable re- directions thing. This was a modernized recipe. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm. So they still managed to fuck it up, apparently. <laughs> But they were taking one of that kind of recipe where it's like, do there too a goodly amount of salt or whatever. Yes. And, yeah, oh my God. and updating <laughs> it for the modern yeah. kitchen. Yeah. But they were unclear. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until actually, so one of the one of the drawbacks of this being only stuff that had been made before is I didn't <laughs> notice, despite reading the recipe multiple times beforehand, I didn't notice until doing it that the direct the ingredients 
have dried fruit. The directions oh. at no point mention the fruit. That's oh. Interesting. oh, yeah. So <laughs> I think they just did a bad job. Yeah, and I am wholly innocent here. <laughs> yes, of course you are. If you get Dr. Richard Hardbody going in IRL, they have a whole stand-up bit they do about French people inventing like chocolate and caramel making. <laughs> <laughs> about how fucking weird it is. Yeah. <laughs> I have to hear this. Yeah. Yeah, I do love those old cookbooks, though. I like, um, you know, the, the people on, like, there's a bunch of YouTube channels where they try to recreate those, and you'll see them reading this and going, okay, place in bread oven, not meat oven, and bake until yeah. you be well done. Yeah, whatever. How hot is that? <laughs> and then they have to go do, like, five hours of research, and they come back, and they're like, okay, we're baking this at 350. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the difference yeah, between it, the bread oven and the meat oven is temperature. So yeah, because yeah, that that yeah. then, as like someone who was a chef for like most of my life, like you get to the point of, am I doing this as a history experiment, yeah. or am I actually trying to make this taste good? Yeah. Because you're like, if I'm doing it as a history experiment, I'm I'm like, I know that's not going to fucking work, but we're doing yeah. it like it says anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I I know better than whoever wrote this, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you're right. You're right. That's apples and oranges too, because it's like, do I want to make a dish for my dinner party that everyone right. will eat, or do I want this to be accurate? Because actually, in most cases, you can't have both. Because it's because <laughs> it can be fun to be like, yeah. oh, this is what it was like, you know. If you like, if you're into like food and cooking, you're like, yeah. Oh, this is fucking like for a modern palate. This is mm -hmm. different, you know. Yeah. I fucking hate when people say food is gross. As a sh ex chef, I'm like, it's not yeah. gross. No food is gross. You just don't like it. Fuck yeah, off. You just, don't like it. Just, say, just say that you don't like it. And just move say on. this yeah. isn't for you. And yeah, yeah. Well, and particularly when other people in other cultures think it's delicious, or exactly. in other time oh. periods, you know, oh my, God, my like whistle. <laughs> you know, it really so grinds my gears. <laughs> drinking at 4 p.m. talking about people who don't appreciate food. Good food. Yes, I have. Exactly. This is kind of like a half-remembered thing, and I think I, I think I might still have the cookbook somewhere in my epic pile of books. But uh, Garrett, Garrett, you might know about this. That uh, there was, I, I feel like I have this cookbook somewhere, but I've seen. I remember seeing it. Um, there was a certain period in uh, English history when uh, early in, in colonialism, when they were bringing a lot of sugar back from the colonies. So it was kind of a marketing thing where they wanted everyone to use a lot of sugar. And so this re these recipes are like spinach pie with sugar, fish pie oh. with lots of sugar, <laughs> crusts of sugar around your, around your, you know, mussels and oysters. <laughs> it's just By the like way, you guys sugar where it should not be. <laughs> 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 right but uh th is it, do you do you have you ever seen that though like there, there was this period there was this period when like there was this influx of sugar and people just went sugar crazy and, and put it in a lot of things That's that we so would odd. recoil from <laughs> today. yeah oh, it's funny because it was like before then exactly. when sugar was only was only <laughs> imported from you know south asia um in europe it ended up being used and on a grand scale sometimes but they would use it almost as a spice because they couldn't mm -hmm. get big enough amounts of it so when it no. hit and they could suddenly just bake with it or whatever then it was like let's That's blacken our you teeth ended up with, with sugar sugar pie totally. <laughs> going on, yeah going sugar high. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah the well, apples apples of today are not yesterday's apples mm -hmm. that i didn't realize i how, <laughs> how have apples changed Oh God! There's like eighteen hundred have... varieties for one. Yeah, well, a lot of them have that. changed to be more stable over shipping mm, distances. Yeah. So um, you lose you lose taste in that. Um, I don't know much beyond that, so don't no. don't question me too closely. <laughs> but I know that yeah. a lot of the really common varieties are just more. You have to have transportable. Have Dr. Richard Hardbody on, and they can just like talk for Expound. hours about like <laughs> yeah weird cooking shit yeah. <laughs> oh yeah next time i make we some should... weird historical food let's go yeah, we should yeah have just instead yeah. of me yeah come on <laughs> they're much That'd be great. i'm like a good chef but they are much more like weird knowledgeable <laughs> you know i do have a disgusting cookbook collection <laughs> mm. i even have a cookbook book a book of cookbooks oh yes <laughs> god because faden has my number they're like, do you want a book where each spread is a sp is a photo of a different cookbook <laughs> spread? I'm like, oh my god, yes, I do. <laughs> no, obviously. Yeah. Are you guys people who watch like TikToks of chefs? Yes. Like, okay. I the one that I think I'm fixated on is the Hebridean Baker. 
And all uh, my TikToks are fed to me by Dr. Richard Hardbody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you should check out the Hebridean Baker, first of all, because he's cute and has a cute boyfriend and he's a old. cute dog, but also, <laughs> <laughs> but also because they're, they're Hebridean recipes, which I, which a lot of which have that very traditional mm. and in some way, you know, ancient feel to them, um, but with modern ingredients. And, uh, and I find, I find that whole thing really fascinating. Of course, TikTok, you only have a very small amount of time to convey you know, the complexities of a recipe. So most of them are fairly simple, uh, which is also appealing to me. But, um, but TikTok yeah. is filling the void that was left by Vine, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, because yeah. if people tried to fill that void and they failed. Yeah. I know, Jared, it's not the same. We know it'll never I, be the same. But TikTok is doing some TikTok, of the same type of content that Vine was doing. There's I being still miss Vine. Like, yeah. For yeah, yeah, I did short like Vine. comedy, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's making not... people be short. That's what does it. Like you need mm -hmm. to give limitations. Yeah. I'm not on TikTok because I feel like I'm I'm past the the legal upper late age limit. <laughs> I feel TikTok, like I would be but... like hanging out hanging out in high school like that. You know, like hey, yeah. how do you do, fellow kids? I, yeah. I, would, I would love I'm to set up TikTok and then just even like, though I work. don't know how to use it. Yeah. And just like when <laughs> someone made me get on, what was the one where it disappeared? It was the um, one that Snapchat. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I have a I have a terrible fear because the UIs are so badly done and hard to use that yeah. I have a fear that I'm gonna like post like some very inappropriate photo I don't mean to <laughs> to everyone you know because like the follow button, you like, the, the UIs <laughs> the UIs and all that is shitty I, I'm yes. on TikTok just because I people were starting to like read my tweets as like inspo inspo. Yeah. Hashtag inspo. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to keep track of this shit. You know? <laughs> like, but um oh, look at this them, Jared. They just must be okay. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan and I in the chat, like, yeah. we're hungry. We're Jordan hungry and Jordan. getting slightly drunk surly. <laughs> like, look at this asshole. Eating his, watching eating his big goods of glory. <laughs> no, no. It's Feed fine. it to me through the screen now, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> this is always the, this the tragic thing. The tragic thing about Jared being in Seattle is that yes, we can't actually. Some Although days I feel less like... tragic than others, and I think this is one of those. Times. I've always wanted to go to Seattle, though. So if I ever do get the go, it'll be like a guild. Yeah, and... me too. And if I ever yeah. just just gonna show up at your place and be like, I'll just be show up at Jared's place. Okay. Like, okay. <laughs> we expect you to have soul cakes yeah. Yeah. every time. Now. Ready at the door. You said they yeah. keep. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the things yeah. that you've prepared so far, Jared, I think these would fare best in the mail. I think you could just like thank you. The the mail is soul like, cakes, just, man. Just mail us the soul cakes. They would really um, not change at all. The showrunner, the showrunner, just said you had to. So like we're expecting <laughs> it. <laughs> People used to um, keep them for luck, not eat them, right. just like keep them. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I was reading one account by somebody who interviewed somebody or something this is very old it's like 1860 i think right. interviewed somebody who had had one for a or had one that was 100 years old because of how long people been keeping it for luck well wow. ew <laughs> nobody was gonna eat it it was just there no. because but even the like it's we need to have people who are brave enough to try these things. But then they're so <laughs> like, like like I kind of some small part of me did want to sip the mummy juice and find oh. out like, oh. like yeah. i always have the small oh. part like you should fuck around and find out jordan <laughs> yeah. but then i'm like but then i have the other part i'm like uh, my biggest fear is death and dissolution so maybe not <laughs> no. no no i just want to i want to drink the so booze we need that they found in the shipwreck from like five yeah, uh, like 700 years ago yeah. 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 yeah well and uh there was something i don't know what was it a couple of years ago they were like we found this amazing five thousand year old bog butter i'm like i will make toast can i have oh, yeah. some bog butter yeah. they're like you can't yeah. have any bog yeah, butter. if scientists you? scanned it and they're like there's nothing in this that would hurt you. I it's just butter. Ten thousand yeah. percent would actually eat it. Let yeah. me put it on my toast. Yeah, it'll <laughs> happen. Yeah, give me some bog. The butter. bog preserves it. It's fine. The bog, exactly. the bog preserved it. I mean, what? It was in like a Sorry. perfectly wrapped like package. It yeah. just yeah. happened to be in a bog. I think yeah. you now have come up with what's going to be our first official heist. Yeah, <laughs> we need the bog butter. Bring yes. us the bog butter. <laughs> no, I, I'm in. I'll, I'll go find my tactical black turtleneck. Oh, I think we have funeral cakes. Do we have funeral cakes? Some the high tech. I don't know what they're supposed to look lunch. like, so I'm gonna say sure. 
our hidden high tech device is just something that keeps the toast warm. It's not like it doesn't help us get in anywhere. It's like a a toast warmer. (laughs) (laughs) Just as forbidden bug butter. (laughs) It's only forbidden until we heist it. And then after that, then it's delicious. delicious (laughs) (laughs) Rebecca says this crew should stick to writing and not open a restaurant. No. Uh, unless it's, excuse unless you, I have opened many what is restaurants. The worst that could possibly pandemic happen? cat. Yeah. Of and I didn't do any of the things I said today in my restaurants. We could call the restaurant <laughs> Bog Butter. Call a restaurant Bog Butter, yes. People Spooky. would come. Oh, people would totally come. But you have to think about it. No, it has to be like Bog plus Butter or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so Butter and Bog. Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, when you're talking about like people saving shit, it made me think about um, people saving wedding cake pieces. Oh, that and then I yeah. saw Jared's yeah. little kitchen and I thought about my tiny kitchen. And I was like, that's a mighty ass shit. People who have enough room in their freezer that they can dedicate it to just leaving things yeah. in there. Yeah. Like my <laughs> freezer is like piece. the most like contested. Everything is like Lego yeah. in there. You know? it's like- <laughs> my parents saved a little piece of theirs. But um, to be fair, that is uh, Guyanese black cake, which is right. soaked with rum. Right. And um, uh, yeah, dude, it probably it... would have still been good if they had eaten it on their first year anniversary. But I think my dad found it in there and like, oh, a little lump. <laughs> they should put, it, they should put so... it in the middle of Lucite. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they probably should have. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. As a paperweight. Oh, oh, oh. There they are. are. There they You're are. All... Them's just muffins. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funeral muffins. Yeah. Funeral muffins. Muffins of the dead. Muffins of the dead. Death muffins. Now at Mick Cafe. (laughs) Jared, refresh my memory. I know you went over this at the beginning, but these are these are not actually like they 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 they're more just something you would have at a funeral than something that actually you would like eat sin with. (laughs) Well, they descend from that tradition, but yeah, this would be like. Do they have a ceremonial function of any kind? They used to. Now okay. it just now they just exist. Did you do a sin while making them? <laughs> um, no, I he's on camera the whole time. Say. I mean, we the cameras like I, cameras can show everything. We don't know. <laughs> he wasn't Did off freeze camera. For a second. <laughs> I mean, if you're only off camera for thirty seconds, how much sinning can you do in thirty seconds? I mean, I saw that mm-hmm. horror film host. Like, oh yeah, there could be uh, things going on behind the, the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, other side yeah, of that. That's true. You guys didn't see what have... I was up to when I was taking off my costume. I mean, I could have been a know. gift this whole time. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Did these have any kind of spices in them as well? Or yeah. these... no, because they're American. So oh. They're oh, yeah, no, yeah. We don't do flavor. We don't like flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in Louisiana, and then we love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's just because we're French, not because we're American. Yeah. <laughs> Well, flavor Creole. is un-American. Yeah, I mean they've got French. vanilla in them, and I love okay. vanilla, so I'm fine oh, yeah. with that. But okay, so they will yeah, they have some bit... flavor. They're not just a a bland muffin. What are these leavened with? Do these have yeast in them, or do they just egg? no? They're baking powder. That's uh, how you can powder. tell it's yeah. a really recent recipe. I mean, once again, mm. I, I have to go to like sausage gravy, man. Like these are yeah. like, these are just aching for it. <laughs> I, I deny this. You put like four of those in a bowl and then you put some gravy over them and they're like dipping dots, but gravy and bread. <laughs> <laughs> Savory dipping dots. That is the, we are opening a restaurant. Yeah. I, I, um, yeah. Yeah. I did a version of um, poutine, which I know Canadians, this is um, heresy. I am interested. Where I did yeah. like little bite-sized pretzel bites and fried and fried um, cheese curds. And then with a little pitcher of gravy to put over it as, a, as like an app. Oh, that's awesome. No, I great. so much of that. Yeah. No, no, no. If, Canadians if, are not precious about poutine. None of us are poutine yeah. purists. Good, because if like you've the, ever been to like La Banquise, they have like 120 types of, of poutine, poutine on the I menu. I mean, I waited it my, until I was <laughs> in 2008, drunk in Toronto, to eat my first poutine at Poutini's downtown drunk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then I found out that's I should actually be in Quebec or something. Like yeah. to have like, <laughs> to have, like that's where they have proper poutine. Yeah. yeah. Proper which poutine. which no one's ever yeah. invited me to go to no. Quebec. And the proper well. poutine comes out of a chip wagon. It comes out of like yeah. a it's street yes. food. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which I, uh, which which really got Unfortunately, in Montreal, the most... I think it's actually like this weekend. In fact, I think it might be like possibly now or soon. No, World Fantasy is next weekend. Oh, next weekend. But yeah, yeah. One of, and one of my life there, time ambitions. I, I wanted to I'm, go. I'm not yeah. going. There's one of my life plague. ambitions is to go to Joe Beef. 
What's oh, that? Joe Beef is great. I know that's one of my like list <laughs> things in life. It's a, yeah. a like a French um, inspired restaurant, but that does what I did as a chef goes oh. leans into like gilded, what I call gilded trash, yeah. where you're making like home comfort food, but you're using super like I hard to do it. French techniques to do oh, it. Fun. You yeah. know, like so they're like they have like a um a, a sandwich that has like um Velveeta mm -hmm. Mornay with like spam, but it's between like um. What's that puffed up pastry that they fill? Puff pastry? Uh, yeah. Oh, shoe. No, shoe. it's shoe. This is the pastry oh, base, yeah. but what's the thing you make out of shoe when it's long? Oh, that's and it's a eclair. Shirt. It's an yeah. eclair sandwich. Yeah. A savory eclair sandwich. Wow. So you do I all that work and then you just put like cheese whiz between it. Like yeah. I'm not talking about food, I'm dying. That's here. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the most popular thing at the restaurant that I was a chef at for five years was a poutine burrito. Oh like, my God. I, I would do all these like fancy shit and they're like poutine burrito, bestseller. <laughs> That's because like, why wouldn't you want to yeah, yeah. in a tube that you can walk would, around? Well, and eat? Yeah, so you can yeah. walk around with it. So you and I had a gravy, down. I had a gravy core down the middle. Nice. Because if you uh, make gravy and place. you freeze it, you can cut yep. it into long strips, and yep. then when you heat it back up, it's oh. a molten core. It's very clever. <laughs> we may have won awards. Remy, <laughs> 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 what were you saying? I was saying there's a local place that does uh, various types of pierogies, and recently, I guess apparently, they did a poutine pierogi. Ooh, so potato yeah. and cheese and gravy. Yeah, in a pierogi, that idea. would be so good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. really good. Yeah. That, that, that's playing off of like the soup dumpling, where like yeah. you have something gelatinous, and, yeah, you can, yeah. and you can put it inside when it's cold, and when you heat it up, it liquefies. Exactly. Yeah, it was awesome. I'm just trying to to like front on Pedimicat now. That's all I'm doing. It's like, <laughs> you, said, like <laughs> you said I shouldn't open a restaurant. <laughs> I should open a restaurant. I'll come visit. Jared, Jared, are these like cool enough for you to eat one yet? No, they're super hot. I will try oh, one in, okay. in just a little bit. I know we're, we're still under time, so. I mean, once yeah, they're yeah, cool enough, we're, we're we have good. to watch you eat all of them in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, no. And after, and like, after every, after, you have to put one in your mouth, you have to say, Megaphonic TV. And then, <laughs> Megaphonic TV. No, I'm just going to Pac-Man it, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we have to zoom in really close on that. Yeah. For, for every, like for every, thousand bits jerry will eat one more muffin right. so <laughs> make it a was, fundraiser <laughs> that was plain powdered sugar that you sieved over top yeah okay mm. yeah these are going to be very sweet and yes. probably mm. kind of bland yeah yeah um, okay. it seemed like another thing that would be good with ass loads of butter basically yeah. possibly probably. bog butter <laughs> yeah bog butter <laughs> bog i don't butter know if bog you are cake. fixated on bog butter <laughs> <laughs> Well, like every just, few years, I reread this paper. Wondering why you're not That's fixated nice. on bog butter. <laughs> you reread a paper. Wait, paper? I reread a, a paper where these people were recreating bog butter. Hmm. Huh. With like oh. traditional, like even straining the milk through a grass sieve. Nice. Oh, yeah. Are they, are they recreating it sitting in the ground for like 400 years? Peach. Yeah. Well, I mean, not <laughs> that's the part that makes it me want to taste it. They did yeah, that, bury that exactly it. And they, they, they periodically um, dig it up. Like every few yeah. years, they dig it up mm. to taste it again. Excellent. Okay. Ooh, oh that's God. awesome, actually. That's, that's, our, that's our restaurant yeah. right there. That's the... <laughs> yeah, screw this, uh, this dry-aged butter. Or is it steak you're supposed to dry-age? Anyway, screw <laughs> dry-aged oh, what aged butter. <laughs> no, in the Ball middle of each aged. table, there's a column of dirt and plexiglass. Yeah, and you yeah, have yeah. to like, dig out your butter, kind, kind of like, <laughs> kind of like a Kore Korean barbecue People in the middle. People would do it. Someone has a little crowl, and you dig up your butter pat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, The look. crown is back. The crown is back. The crown is back. The crown is <laughs> i think go. you should just wear that to work <laughs> yeah that's yeah a look. absolutely that's a whole yeah, look. i think, I think like you should just wear that in just, general it's very just wear it in general it's wear it to go buy fetching. groceries yeah yes <laughs> wear it to go out and get coffee hmm. i feel like you were born to wear this type of thing <laughs> but yeah it suits you <laughs> it's like it's like getting close to your final form <laughs> <laughs> a catacomb saint yeah. Yeah. Do you have but to be the saint cooler. at anything like in particular, or are you just saint? Period. End of story. Just saint. Just a saint. Okay. A lot of them are just like generic saints that are like, well, this person, sure. Why not? <laughs> we'll have to ask Cassandra Call what saint they you are. Nice. Saint of. Was oh, it? Yeah. Was it like a? a That's their whole thing? thing. If you were, if you were, if you were rich, would you get buried as a as a as a saint? No, or no, no. Is it no, no, okay. Oh, no, so you have to be like nice and good. Yeah, there are very specific criteria for who hmm. gets to be a saint. Um, and they they weren't picky for a while. They are picky now. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, they're very picky now. Oh, they got my chances. 
So, yeah, well, I mean, there's a ton of like medieval saints that are clearly just legendary. Yeah. Y'all have okay, all we're looked talking at, about like, there's, there's, like, through, like the whole application process. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Y'all have all saints, looked at the Sedlik the... Ossuary, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. I love that shit. <laughs> the best part, though, is not the, the bone pits, not that like a blind guy was making pyramids. It's mm -hmm. that the fucking guy wrote his, his signature in bones on one wall. Yeah. <laughs> That's clearly the best. Yeah. Whose bones? <laughs> Oh, just no. random, oh, random, random bones. I don't think it matters. Yeah. But there's Jared, this is the this is what I was wondering. Like, yeah, and there's there's the whole thing oh, becoming a saint. I have because... something sinful. I don't know what it is, but it's mm. small and baked. Tiny pancakes. Uh, uh, but how did one how did one get to be a jeweled saint in the catacombs? Is what I is what I want to know. They just <laughs> they just decided to do it. Um, I don't I don't know the exact <laughs> process, but it was it was um. There's this whole underpinning of Catholicism, mm. especially medieval or, you know, older than modern Catholicism, where flesh, especially of a saint, is sanctified. So mm. that's right. why relics are a thing. So you want mm -hmm. to beautify the relics as an act of devotion, because this is, this is post the really, <laughs> um, post the really big relics thing with people making pilgrimages to see them as opposed to that but it's pre i think this is like 15 1600s when they were doing it um, um so that they were still glorifying the incorruptible holy body but right. just in a different way with this very material process Right, right. Embroidery did they, and jewels. would they tell you when you were alive that you were going to be a catacomb saint, yeah, or did they wait yeah. until you were dead? <laughs> oh, you, you you would be dead. Um, because okay, these are all like one. these are all yeah. people who are already <laughs> saints, and then oh, at this point they were okay. it was let's let's switch our acts of devotion to this kind of thing. Because yeah. I don't yeah. believe what okay. was happening. So they're digging them up, as it were, and and yeah. Well, I feel like yeah, the I think a lot of them were ah, like just hanging well, out in the catacombs, which is why okay. they're called that. Hanging but out. then they decided to like <laughs> pull them, pull them up, and beautify them yeah. as part of this. Yeah, it's so funny. A it lot of them, you look at pictures. A lot of them just lie down like this. Yeah, and yeah. Like, holding a palm branch in one hand. It's very, yeah. they're very flirty. It's very beautiful. The whole, the whole thing with the catacombs and the the, the, the the skeletons down there is it's it's such a it's such a social way to dispose of your body. You know, I mean, yeah. like yeah. we all all of, we think of like most of the ways of you like being buried or being um, uh, they're, cremated, they're isolated. Like you're, you're alone. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you're like hanging out with a bunch of other skeletons. Like, in a, my skull a is touching your skull. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, I don't know if that's terrible or kind of comforting, but you sort of like, and you know, like hundreds of years later, tourists are coming and looking at you and taking photos. It's just that's like, exactly it. Yeah, but like by the mass grave has such never a bad connotation, and catacombs <laughs> has such like a pleasant connotation. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those saints too are so covered, and they have like glass domes over their heads. They they yeah. look yeah. like exoskeleton Astronauts. necronauts, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you look up the relics of Mary Magdalene, yeah. her skull has one of those astronaut helmets. She's I like love a it. Lamb wow, I love it. It's the yeah. best shit ever. That's my yeah. Ever. <laughs> Some of them have um, little pearls stitched yeah. over their eyes, or yeah. like weird mouths. It's. I think it's so fascinating, just not yeah. only as a finished art object, but the 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 process, the the thought process, the metaphysics, I guess, of it are so interesting mm -hmm. to me. So. Yeah, imagine well, going to a party yeah, back then. Too. Yeah, I'm being like, so what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I I sew pearls around. Uh, <laughs> well, a lot, that, a lot of that labor was done by nuns. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. Who wouldn't also, be like, like anyway, presumably. They had their own, you already got nun parties, you know? There's nun parties. <laughs> also, <laughs> like, with, because of all the, the Buzz Lightyear now, with all that home invasion, home annihilator talk earlier, I mean, the new yeah. Buzz Lightyear, definitely a home annihilator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't watched the trailer. <laughs> I'm avoiding it. I haven't watched it either. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's he, he's a fucking cop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looks he like is. a fucking cop. I don't know. Just yeah. He's got a cop face. I just, I, I want to go back to this image of these nuns sitting around yeah. embroidering pearls on like a quilting party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a yeah. yeah. yeah like it's it's a gals crap. doing gal stuff. Gals doing gal stuff. Well, it's, oh, where's you're the, there it's with, your, with your nun wife or your nun yep. girlfriend and you like put pearls on skulls. 
that's yeah. it. Yeah. Or like Absolutely. the people who made reliquaries and stuff. And they're like, yeah, you know, I made this incredibly huge, gorgeous, elaborate structure out of gold and silver and ivory and mother of pearl. And things we had to get brought in from thousands and thousands of miles away. And yeah, that's, um, oh, you probably can't see it. Yeah, that's a that's a pinky toe bone. <laughs> yeah. the saints, uh, there on the velvet. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this took like awesome. me 12 years to make. Yeah. The, the Sedlik ossuary came from like people wanting to be buried on the church ground and there was mm. no more room Ooh. in the ground because the ground was pure bones. Yeah. So they started just throwing it into the church and they had a blind yeah. monk in there who they said, do something with this. And so he, <laughs> without knowing, started making pyramids of bones and stuff. And then they later hired an artist. But like that shit Wild. comes from just like trying to scam people. Like <laughs> you, you you get to be married in the churchyard and you get to be married in the churchyard. No. <laughs> so how are they, the gates of death. Yeah. <laughs> they are aggressively okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're good. They're definitely like, you know, maybe you've been to your, I don't know, grandfather's funeral. You don't really want a very challenging dessert. No. This Did it say get. to put powdered sugar on it in the recipe? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I mean they're they're good. They're just not like they're more comfort food sort of thing. You wouldn't Yeah. Know. They both they're sound not... like things that you could have for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Like mild, not too threatening. They're yeah. easier ways. Sweet yeah. things, you know. It's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well that's yeah. cool. It's fine. I wish the soul cakes had worked out better. I might try them oh. again, maybe a different recipe, because mm -hmm. they the, the flavor is really good. And these are okay. Yeah. So well, I'm not really, everyone's a winner. <laughs> I'm particularly taken by the fact that they have saffron in them. I mean, yeah, that yeah. was that was probably the most surprising thing for me. Mm -hmm. So I would I would want to find a recipe and and give them a try as well because I think that would be like it's it's an interesting almost warm spices kind of feel to it. So yeah, it's a very sort of very autumnal winter kind of mm -hmm. yeah, mm. yeah thing. <laughs> nice. Crown keeps going off center. <laughs> <laughs> so we are coming up to two hours. Uh, yes, once again, we, we have uh, completed a recipe and eaten, the, eaten the results. Two recipes, two recipes. yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, yes. Anybody parting thoughts? What are you guys all doing for Halloween? <laughs> this? Yeah. yeah. This is it. <laughs> Too much plague. Yeah. Jordan, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You you live in Plague Central still. We're in Plague Central. We're <laughs> yeah. we're in the yeah. place where like at every opportunity to make a decision, the government goes and consults with COVID and is like, mm -hmm. how can we help you? <laughs> yes, what can we exactly. do for you? How generous. You know, uh, your, do you guys have subsidies. COVID is a strong yeah. lobby presence. Yeah. 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 And I'm to the south of that where we see what you're doing, we go, hold my beer. You know? Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think we've got like three quarters of the remaining plague cases in Canada or something. Oh, it's it's awesome. Awesome. No, it's so I'm hanging out at my house, which is a generally yeah. plague free yeah. place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna we are we are a little bit more plague free in Toronto. We're sort of like tentatively waiting for our premier to screw it up again as is his <laughs> want. But <Pretty> much. <laughs> at the moment but at the moment you can like there are children who are going to come to our building and get candy. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, things like that. So uh, there, there is some sense. I mean, I don't know what's happening on Church Street tonight, but tonight would traditionally be the time when um, queer people would be turning out. Mind you, it's rainy. It's kind of miserable. But mm. they would traditionally be turning out. They'd close down the street. Uh, there would be a lot of people taking photos. There would be costume competitions, that kind of thing. Um, I'm just going to be hanging out at home catching up on episodes of, I don't know, Canada's Drag Race, Dragula. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like that. I live in an in apartment building that doesn't get any kids, unfortunately, oh, but I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to um, go out with some friends and go for a walk in a part oh. of town. Uh, it's it, David, it's near the like junction West oh, yes. End, Junction-ish, um, and basically like walk around and see all the kids in costumes and see the 
yeah. crazy Halloween decorations that people put on their lawn. Oh, we, like we're that. in Cabbage Town, and there is a yeah. ton oh, of Town Halloween decorating here. Yeah, it's crazy because <laughs> they're all old Victorian buildings and uh, Victorian houses, and some of them are just bonkers. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's really cool. Um, I've been really surprised at how and I think a lot of frustration of the pandemic is now channeling itself and things like this. Yeah. Where it's like mm -hmm. if I can't go out and do stuff, I'll do up the house. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. so it's uh, so it's been interesting walking around for sure. I Look think there's going to be a lot of beaming a lot of away, game Jared. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling away underneath of your crown. It's I was delightful. supposed to because the light is like right behind your yeah. head. Very yeah, safely, it's very quite gorgeous. That's part of why I put the crown back on. So <laughs> yeah. you take advantage Jared, of yeah. you think yeah, yeah. Jared doesn't know gorgeous. about the light halo and the yeah, yeah. sitting yeah. right there? He knows all of his angles. <laughs> yeah. With the flowers, he's got kind of a midsummer thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. I've been informed. I just I get to have burgers for Halloween. So that's Ooh, oh, there we go. very nice. <laughs> Mr. Burgers and, for Halloween. And if we are winding up, I just want to say this just came out. Yes. From yes. Neon Hemlock. And you're in it. I'm in it. And they also have published a novella by Premi. So yes. they are a great mm -hmm. publisher to support. They are a great. It was fantastic working with them. I love them. Yeah. Good. And wow. I keep saying them and they and all of them when actually it's just like the one guy and it's Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Even I refer so. to like the press, the entire press is Dave. Yeah. <laughs> like one of, the, one of those. Dave, yeah, and then Mariana. The <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he did like, you know, the cover design and like the copy editing and like the developmental wow. editing and then the typesetting. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, he's a busy <laughs> fucking guy. Yeah. No, I was and he's publishing some great, not not talking about myself, but he's publishing some great writers too. Yeah. What's Pre the name of the name Wagner, like, name yeah. Of the, name of the press? Neon Hemlock. Yep. Neon Hemlock. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. I don't have my... A speculative right fiction right focused right queer <laughs> press. Yes. Nice. They're fantastic. Okay. Anything else you guys want to want to plug or um... uh, buy my book? It just came out in it's September. Amazing. It's pretty and it's really good. <laughs> all three of us, all four of us, have Patreons. Yeah. <laughs> Patreons think, and right? Twitters. Dave, you have a Patreon. <laughs> I my I don't use my Patreon. I actually should try. But to it do sits something there, with it. and you should it's... give them money. Yeah. Well, there you <laughs> I go. I mean, my my Patreon. I from the beginning said you don't get anything. You're just supporting me. And each yeah. level is a different curse that happens to you. So, <laughs> see, that's a great idea. That's because probably... I mean, the idea of Patreon should be a patron to support you in what you're already doing. Because so much right. of what we do is we, me, me and Jarrett write a lot of stuff online for free. Yeah. And if you enjoy that every day and you read it, don't you owe me, us maybe at least a dollar a month? <laughs> yeah. You know, tip them. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a tip. Exactly. Yeah. Keep people going. Yeah, yeah. Don't make your artists and writers who are right now thinking about starting Patreon. Don't make a second job for yourself. Only well, post a lot shit. Of people do. Only post shit you're people, already doing on yeah, there. A lot of people seem to like create entire second careers out of it. And mm. I don't know to what end. It does make sense only to do the stuff you're already doing anyway. I mean, and, if you uh, want Patreon to be your career, yeah. I think that's short sighted, but you can do that. But if you also <laughs> yeah. want to be an artist that is published other places and can be seen by people from outside of a paywall. You should yep. just use Patreon to let your fan base support you. Exactly. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end the broadcast. So if we all wanna like <laughs> that's a whole nother <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, two hours of talking about Patreon. Like... <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank I had so much fun hanging wonderful. out with these people. And yeah. thank you for baking, Jared. This was yeah. lovely. Yeah. It was fun thanks, to watch. Thanks for baking and eating it all, Jared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the single, the single tear. <laughs> folks, folks at home watching this or watching it later, uh, there are many more fancy little live streams on megaphonic.fm's Twitch stream that you might enjoy, including a lot that have to do with um, there's some there's some people are playing games, people are doing crosswords, we play games on Friday nights. It's all it's all a good time. So do check that out. Check out megaphonic.fm for podcasts as well. Jared has one uh, that is yep. about Tolkien. And new episode all things, is out on Monday. All cool. things Tolkien. Think Monday. Yeah. Um, and check back in with us again next month. We are going to do this next month again. Uh, I th actually, I think December 4th will be the next one. So. Oh, very nice. Christmas Eve. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Jared will, Fancy for Christmas Eve, be wearing the skull outfit again. <laughs> yes, it's it's Bye. it's suitable for all occasions. It's perennial. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going full Annunciation Angel for, okay. yeah, for oh, Christmas. Yeah, oh 